Hey, what's happening, everybody? Hi, welcome to the Jeff Gerstmann Show. It's a podcast. It's about video games. And I'm your host for this week's edition of the show. My name is Jeff Gerstmann. Hello. Uh, good uh, tidings upon the... What the... F- All right. <laughs> Hi everyone. It's uh it's Tuesday, so we're uh, we're back in the we're back in the saddle. Doing a podcast. Cuz it's it's video games o'clock. Um I got I yeah, I don't know. Uh it's it's been a yeah, yeah, this room is fine now. This a lot of people are asking. This room is fine now. I I will get into it. I bought this is this is stupid. I get why it exists, but this is stupid. I was at the, I had to go to the seven 11 this morning. Um, and they had in their case, these, these bottles of ghost. uh, different flavors than the cans of ghost. This one is orange squeeze. I think they, I don't know what they call the orange flavor in the cans, but these bottles, which, uh, say right at the top here, zero caffeine. Um, it's like an electrolyte drink. They are billing it as a hydration drink. And so it has zero caffeine in it. It's like a Gatorade. But like the ghost, the entire ghost brand started as like protein powders that were like pre-workout, like let's, let's light it up before we do hella reps type stuff. And, uh, and so, but, but now the brand has expanded on them to the point where now they have to have a zero caffeine offering. I assume this is similar to the, the, what the fuck, the guy, the, 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 the professional wrestler, Logan Paul, you know him. Um, uh, he has a, a drink that was an energy drink. And because he is popular with the kids, they also sell a hydration version that has no caffeine because a lot of parents don't want their kids to have caffeine. And so I wonder if it's a similar thing of like, the ghost brand got too strong. Yeah, that's, it's a fair question. Someone in chat asks, is, is Logan Paul still popular with the kids? I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I, I've never met a person who like genuinely was like, yeah, man, I fucking love Logan Paul. Jake Paul, those guys, man, I'm, I'm more of a Logan kind of guy uh, than, a, than a Jake Paul kind of guy. But, you know, um, like if anything, Logan Paul, I think is on people like, the radar of adults now in a way that he has never been before now that he is doing professional wrestling. He's quite, I think he, I think he fits into that environment very well. He seems like a fucking dick. Um, and that's the role he's played. It's perfect. He's, he's, it's perfect. Uh, he's, he's good at that. He's good at being a fucking dick. Uh, and so he, he fits really well into that thing. More, more like dipshit influencer types should grow into, uh, into re- professional wrestling. I think. Um, no, they shouldn't because he's, he's, he's legit, he's legit good at it. He's, he's very, he's, he's he is good at the physical stuff. He's, he's it's, it's surprising. You go like, man, I, like this guy's all right. I mean, he's a dick, but he's all right. Anyway. That all leads us to I, what I assume is this is like zero caffeine orange drink that I, I just wanted to try. So I don't know. I just like. Oh, yuck. It's okay. Well, I don't know. It's okay. It, it, it tastes like a bad orange Gatorade. It's like it's halfway between an orange Gatorade and Sunny Delight, but it's not. It's not good enough at being either one of those things. Um. But, um, I don't know. You could get hydrated. And then I bought another can. We've, we've already ranked this one, so I'm not going to rank any drinks, but I bought another can of the esports drink because I figure this is going to disappear eventually. But ghost has a, um, a flavor that they have done in conjunction with the phase clan. Um, So I got one of those. Oh yeah, it's yeah, this is okay. This phase still exists, right? Like they they I don't I I've yeah, uh, I know phase is not 
phases like they went public right they've been like like they've been a a penny stock like laughing laughing stock really uh for for a good long time um i don't know if they're good at any games anymore or or what remember there was a, a while there where it seemed like they were going to be like oh this is where esports goes mainstream we've got snoop dog is joined phase like all this other weird like lifestyle brand bullshit that they did and uh yeah. There are no hundred thieves. That's what I say. I don't know. Um, but you see, I guess it's been a long time since I've seen anyone um, pretending to be a, a part of phase clan, like in their call of duty names or whatever, like throwing the word phase in there to, you know, show that they are fans of that or, or whatever. But um, they were a big CSGO team. Okay. Yeah. I'm, all right. Sure. I don't know. Um, good on them, I guess. But that's not where the money is, right? It's in the, uh, it's in the shirts and and whatever else. Like one hundred thieves sold the naming rights to their training facility, which is just a warehouse that they filled full of trash. Of of like a neon, like like you know, like a fucking, uh like a neon, like, you know, there, there's there, corporate video games. And I don't mean video games made by corporations. I mean the, the corporate marketing of the gamer image. You know what I mean? Just like, I got a fucking cool neon and we got all these, these fucking weird hexagons on the wall behind us, even though like we don't record audio in this room. <laughs> Like just like a bunch of fucking stupid shit everywhere, uh, and it's just a it, yeah, it's it's a disaster, man. And and like that being the the I don't know, there's something about that being the that becoming like the shorthand for like the fucking gamer aesthetic, um, is fucking so crazy to think about. When I think about the when you take the the long history of video games. And you take this sliver of like where we're at, where we have been over the last handful of years here of like gaming and influencers and the rise and fall of that as a concept and, and just like where all of that shit is at. It's so fucking nuts, man. Um, you're just like, no, nah, man, I don't know. Yeah. I put a quarter into this mappy machine and it, uh, this, this mouse cop runs really good uh, Yeah, to like decades later to uh, whatever the, or, you know, I, there's a midpoint. There's a midpoint. It, it's where the term gamer originated, right? And there are still people that are just like, they can't wrap their minds around this. And they, they like, they get really, they still get really mad when people are like, oh, fucking gamers. Um, and they don't, they don't know their fucking history. You know, that like the term gamer showed up in EA press releases. You know, it wasn't some organic term that people started calling themselves like, well, I'm a gamer. It, it was like, well, we think that the uh, the gamers enjoying Madden this year, they're going to fly that flag. They're going to, you know, we're really going to... It was always meant... Like, it, it's basically... It is the video gaming equivalent of the term mark. Uh where it is like the the fucking like oh these dipshits will buy anything like oh yeah they're getting uh they're they're yeah they they love madden these fucking kids you know because because they can't say these fucking kids anymore in their uh in their sales meetings or whatever they eventually came to the term gamer and then the idea that like years later that that then got co-opted and people like started like really identifying as that in a fucking weird way is sad as someone who has been playing and enjoying video games for decades, um, the whole thing is is just like gross. <laughs> I don't know, uh, but like that's whatever. That you know, words change meaning over time, and, and like that legacy. Someone wrote in and said, "Are you still mad about the game?" The, the like last week and said you used to really hate the word gamer, uh, and I'm like, yeah, I, I think it's gross. Um, I think it's gross. To, I think it's a gross way to refer to people who play video games. Um. 
but it's because I have that history. But like nowadays, like whatever, it's it's not you know, like it's it's lost that history, and now it's just like people who play video games just call themselves that and all right all right sure i guess if you want to if you want to do that like movies you know didn't need i don't know you can just be a fan of something just be like you can just say i like video games you don't have to I don't know. um it's not the analogy of viewer or listener because player is right there so i think player is actually a better player it's a better term. What up, player? See? That doesn't that sound fucking better. Um anyway, power to the players. Uh I bought a game synth. We talked about that a little bit last week. Um last Thursday night. I wired that thing up and streamed a bunch of it. That video is on YouTube if you have not seen it yet. Uh if you want to see this, if you if you're unfamiliar, which I wouldn't blame you. Uh, the game scent is a is a uh, it's a weird hexagon. It's a weird box. Um, it is a it's a it's an oil diffuser. You know the same way like someone would put a, a you know a, a bottle of lavender oil in a corner of the room and uh, and let it you know it's a calming effect or you know whatever the fuck it's supposed to do. Um, only instead of lavender scents and whatever they tried to come up with gamer sense um and so it has things like gunfire and explosions and uh, what is it literally it, it's gunfire explosions racing forest and storm and there is a sixth scent that is called clean air that you are supposed to use when you're done to cleanse a room that's important we'll get to that later but the the short version of it is that you take this thing you put it on your wi-fi network and then there's another little box and you route audio through it. Uh, whether that's via HDMI or like a headphone jack, depending on your particular setup, you route your audio into it. And then you put that on your Wi-Fi network. And presumably from looking at the tra network traffic and the hundreds of megabytes that it uploaded over the course of that stream, um, it seems like it's taking your audio and shuttling some version of it off-site for processing because they say it's powered by AI. So I imagine that's the whatever. The, 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 however that part of it works, the the thrust of it is that it is listening to your game audio for sounds like gunfire and sounds like explosions and sounds like racing noises. And then it will occasionally emit a scent. It will have a puff of this oil um, puff out of the device. It's 150 bucks. The AI, the the sound processing stuff, I'll say it, it it works reasonably well. The uh the other thing I'll say about it is that every single scent that comes out of it, with rare exception, is disgusting. And also not very accurate. This is basically the conclusion we reached by streaming some Call of Duty. Basically the 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 latest video games, you know, Call of Duty, 50 Cent Blood on the Sand, Bellatro. Uh, you know, we needed to know what these video games smelled like. And so I went through a, a handful of them. Uh, Dino Wars, Destruction of Spondylus, Loose, Less, Mouse, whatever, however that's pronounced. Um, and um, so for about three hours, I uh, filled this room full of scent. And... Um, yeah, the, most of them are bad. The gun, the, and they and they're not very accurate. The gunfire doesn't really smell like a gun going off. Um, uh, racing kind of smelled a little smoky, like a little liquid smoky in some ways. Uh, and um, it was a lot of putrid scents. Forest smelled like really low rent, trashy bootleg pine saw. Uh, just really, really nasty. And then, so you, you, you know, played that for some hours and then got to the point where it's like, okay, let's time, it's time to manually trigger the clean air scent, which they advertise as like, at the end of your session, we hit our air neutralizer to neutralize the scent in the air and clean up your room. I'm like, okay, great. I push that button because you have to manually fire that one off. 
the clean air scent smells like the most sickly sweet cotton candy vape smell. Like someone busted into my room and said, do you want to see my sick vape tricks? And then proceeded to rip clouds for like fucking five minutes straight. It was a disaster. It was the worst scent of them all. And it's this, again, disgustingly sweet. And this is what they're like, this is clean air. (laughs) And so... Uh, you know, right about that time, right about two hours in on this three hour stream, I was like, oh shit, there's no way I'm going to be able to get the disgusting smell out of this fucking room. Like I, I left the room to go to the bathroom or something and came back in. I was like, oh, this room's a disaster. This room is uninhabitable right now. Oh shit. What the fuck have I done? Um, and so anyway, the, the stream ended and, and I uh, immediately disconnected everything and, and got it off my Wi-Fi network and, uh, and set it all out in the garage uh, for potential hazardous you know, just disposal or, or something. I don't know what the fuck I'll do with that thing now. Um, and it took about 45 hours, a little under two days. Um, before most of the smell had gone 24 hours in, I was like, Oh shit. Oh shit. Uh, I can't, this is, you know, like I, yeah, I, I kind of, I had a headache. Like we, I did a stream the next day and it was still like, this room still sucks. It's fucking gross in here. Um, I got some Febreze and tried to like Febreze the carpets and stuff. I'm like, oh, I vacuumed in here as well. And and tried to do what I could, um, but like the scent still lingered. It was it was still really, um, really noticeable. I'm not going to say overpowering, but it was noticeable in a way that when you walk in here, it was unpleasant. You're like, this fucking sucks. And it's like this miasma, this 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 glut of these scents kind of come together, um, and. It just was, so, it was, it was incredibly, a, a very gross lingering scent. Um, and so I went out into the garage and I got my air cleaner that I bought when the, when the fires were, uh, happening in Northern California and every, you know, we had to, there was a run on, like you couldn't find air purifiers. They were sold out because everyone was just buying these things. Uh, and so I bought one of those a few years ago. And so I went and found that brought it in here and ran that for a full day. And even that didn't seem like it was immediately helping. Um, it has a sensor in it where it detects if the air is good or not. And for the most part, it was a blue light. And then occasionally it would, the, the light would turn red. Like it would catch a whiff of something and be like, no, we need to turn up to high right now. It's fucking bad in here. Um, it was a weird thing where like, the the upper half of the room's airspace smelled worse than the lower half where when i stood up i would smell it like i was i would be in this spot and i would stand up and go oh um which makes me think that it like got into the fucking i got this this room has a popcorn ceiling which is you know gross in its own way but really good for acoustics if you happen to be recording a podcast and you don't want to put fucking black hexagons all over your wall a popcorn ceiling actually ends up being sort of nice for, for some of that. Um, yeah, I'd say at about the 45 hour mark, I, I walked back in and I was like, Oh, okay. I can't really smell it all that much anymore. Like if I, if I really like, I still smell something in here, but it had been reduced to like, oh, like a 14 year old had his cheap shitty cologne in here and sprayed some on. Like it's, that's, that's what it eventually started to smell like, like, yeah, like teen cologne, um, like the cheap garbage stuff. Um, and yeah, I, it, uh, it, it's, it's mostly gone now. If I, when I walk in the room, if I just, take a deep breath, I'll still go like, oh, hmm, ugh, ooh. Um, so maybe don't buy a game scent. Um, 
it's gross. It's gross. It doesn't enhance the the. It does not enhance the gaming. It uh, it does not. Uh, it does not smell accurate. Um. And it, you know, I, I will say, like, I, I think it is, it is wrong about some things. I don't necessarily think it's a scam per se. I think that, you know, it, when you plug it in, it, it does basically the thing it advertised to do. It just doesn't pay well, or doesn't, does not, uh, does not work, play well. You know, it does it? It smells bad. Um, did anyone else comment on the smell? Um, no. Not, uh, like by the, my, my wife had been gone for a little bit. She was, she was gone that night and most of the next day. And by the time she got back, I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe it, her and I have, her and I have very different sense, senses of smell, or there are definitely things that she smells that I don't and vice versa. Um, but, uh. Yeah. Um, my daughter came in at one point and, and she was like, it's stinky. But I, I, she was, I I don't know if it it was that or something else. She, sometimes she just, you know, sometimes her brother poops and, and so it's hard to say sometimes. So, so that's available now (laughs) if you're interested, um, but it's uh if you want to witness the full experience of you know stinky diffuser oil being blasted in, into my face for 3 hours um that video is on YouTube i believe you can head over to is it you go over to guard.bike and it should redirect you to the YouTube channel if you have not seen it already head on over uh, and thanks again to folks on the Discord for talking about this thing just enough when it got announced last week that I said, all right, I'll be the guy. Your Patreon dollars made it possible. You can go to patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman if you want to hop on board this disgusting nightmare. Uh, and uh, and back the badge. I don't know. I don't know. What, um. Yeah, so that's that's. I feel like uh, I feel like I've I've done my work is done. Someone had to do it. Uh, I took that bullet for you. You're welcome. Uh, that also was my first time playing Bellatro, <laughs> uh, which did not smell like anything. It, it did not have any audio in it that triggered the scent thing. Uh, as far if I remember correctly, we can you know you go back and watch. Um, Bellatro is a card game, uh, that, uh, it is run. It is a, it is a run based card game where you are kind of building poker hands out of a set deck that you are building, uh, as you, as you play and you're getting jokers that will change the rules of your deck and weird other mystical cards that'll do all this other stuff. And basically you're trying to put together enough hands to get enough points to make it to the next round. And so you have to have enough high ranking hands and you can get there by virtue of like, this is a good poker hand or this is a decent poker hand, but I have have so many fucking weird arcane multipliers stacked on top of it from all these other cards and things I have uh, that the math has worked out that I earned a billion points that way too. And it's fucking cool. Um, the, it, it, it's, it's a really fascinating it, it so i guess i the, the other thing i'll say is it's not a gambling game the game is uh, suddenly the the game has suddenly gotten pulled off of and i don't know if it's made its way back on yet i have not seen the word on on that one yet but it got pulled off of some storefronts because the the ranking on it the the ra- the content rating um was re-rated in some areas to 18 plus uh, because they think it's a gambling game. Uh, and they're like, well, it has elements of gambling. And so as a result, it's not a three plus game. It's an 18 plus game and we're pulling it down. Um, which is insane. 
it, it's like I don't know. It it uses it it very loosely uses some of the rules of poker because you are uh you are building hands that work in poker, but it's not gambling. It's not teaching you the the rules like you're not playing actual poker. Um it, it's a really weird move. Uh sun 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 uh, sunshine shuffle from Strange Scaffold got hit by something similar just prior to release. Um, partially because of the creator's uh, TikTok campaign about it, I believe. Um, but that's a, you know, that has poker in it. Uh, and that's, that is you playing poker, but it's not, it's not actual. It's not, you know, you're not, no money is changing hands. It is just teaching you the rules of a card game. Um, so yeah, I, that but, but yes, Bellatro has run into some weird problem around that stuff. But it sounds like it's doing quite well. It's, it, the Steam version has stayed up at least, so so that's that version is available. I know that much. Um, and it's really neat. It's a really neat spin on poker rules. It's it's like it's no more of a gambling game than like fucking. You could play Go Fish for money if you wanted to, and in fact, I will. You want to play Crazy Eights for money? I'm your fucking guy. Um, but hey, I, I don't know. Seems, seems ridiculous that that game has been slapped with a, some kind of gambling related rating. Um, but yes, it is, uh, you know, I, I was initially a little, um, cold to the concept because of it being a deck builder and it, you know, it being labeled as such and, you know, the, the way it was being billed pre-release. Um, but I, I tried it to figure out what it smelled like and, um, it's great. It's a, it's a fantastic game. It's, it's a really, it's a really wonderful, like run based card game kind of thing. Uh, and some of the, the modifiers and multipliers and, and the, some of the various jokers that can come into your hand and, and really make things crazy, uh, are very interesting to see like as you're uncovering and, and seeing some of that stuff for the first time you're like oh my god this is a game changer this means now i need to play this way and now i need to combo this way and and so the number of ways you can kind of think about something as simple as a hand of poker uh or like this is a pair or this is a full house or, or whatever it is um is really cool you should take a look at Bellatro, even if even if the the way it is described uh, doesn't make it sound like it's for you. I might say just just give a give a look at it. You know this doesn't uh, this doesn't fall into some of the same categories. Like when you when you hear about a rogue light deck builder, calls very specific things to mind over the last few years of game releases. And uh, Bellatro is technically that, but also kind of not. It it is a it is a it is a very different thing. Go go watch it. Yeah, it's in that game sent stream. So if you want to go watch some of it there, but yeah, go go watch some of Bellatro being played. I think you'll you'll very quickly kind of wrap your mind around like what it really is and and if if it seems like your sort of thing or not. Speaking of is this your sort of thing or not? WWE 2K24 came out last night. Um This is this year's wrestling game. Um you know they they've they've redone some models and some face scanning and stuff and so the, like there are some there's some facial animation in there when you're seeing uh Dominic Mysterio having someone jump at him and you know they'll go like, oh, like there, there's there's like decent animations there um it's in like a early access phase right now for people that that play that paid overpaid for it um or if you know you want the DLC because you know it's it's got Post Malone in there. You're gonna need. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna need that. Um, there's really a fuckload of wrestlers in this thing. It's kind of it's kind of neat that way. Um, but I I don't know. It's it just I I went through the tutorial because every year I have to kind of like figure out how do you how do you play this game. 
how do they want you to play this game? What do I, you know, what do I do to to win in this game? Um, and so I I go through the tutorial, and it, the tutorial is always actually like really fun because they they have you know they they put Drew Gulak in it, and he's a fucking goofball, and you hit the tutorial, and it starts. And it's like full screen, high quality FMV of a WWE announcer. And so you're like, this is like production wise. There's some really neat stuff happening here. I just don't, I, I don't like the way it plays. I don't like the, I don't like wrestling games. I like wrestling, but, um, but the idea of this as a competitive game and playing this to either beat a CPU or a, or a human opponent or something like that, like there's just a huge disconnect there for me in terms of like what I'm looking for out of a wrestling game, but also how it presents itself competitively. And I started trying to think about this, like what, what is it? Um, what is it that it's missing? Cause it's, it's not a fighting game. Um, because you kind of play by feel, and I started thinking like maybe it just needs to be like more like a fighting game, and and maybe it needs to present itself much more plainly in terms of like the moves you are doing. Because there's there's always a, like oh I use this and I you know cause, because wrestling is all about wrestling is storytelling. It's cinema. It's 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 the it's the last minute comeback of a guy that got the shit beat out of him for the last seven minutes, making a big comeback and saving the day. Like, oh my God, like, you know, like, like that's wrestling. And so representing that, you almost end up in like a weird, like Mario party thing of like, oh, like one person is playing this as a game of skill. And then the other person pulled out some bullshit and pulled a last minute comeback and went and won the the match and like oh cool great um like that would be realistic to how wrestling often is on television right um it's the, there's no logic to it there's no logic to like I don't know, man, fucking, they threw Sting through a table and he just stood right back up. They punched Sting and he didn't even flinch. Like, but these other punches, he did flinch. And these other, this other table, he did stay down for five minutes. But that one, because he was mad, he stood right back up. And then moved his fist between the other two guys' face for a while. Um, You know, like, like there, there's, there's a... There's wrestling logic, right? There's there's the storytelling logic. There's the wrestling logic. And it's great for what that specific thing is. And adapting that to a video game uh, that you want to be competitive, that you want to have as a competitive like contest between two players, it becomes a very different thing. Like, what are you attempting to accomplish? Like, they, they have a few different, you know, they, they even put like a star ranking up in the corner that's like, are you having a good match or not? And so there's this weird thing of like, oh, if you did a bunch of different moves in the course of your match, then that's maybe going to go up higher because of the move variety or whatever. But ostensibly, you are there to pin the other person. You are there to, or, or make them tap, whatever. You're there to win the match. But they never present you with the data. Or, or rather, the data is often so soft, I suspect. I mean, you know, maybe under the hood, it, it does work this way and they just don't present it that way. But... You know, you have health meters and they'll kind of go down and then they'll go back up and they'll, you know, there's, there's little bits and pieces of, of like that stuff that, that doesn't, that's listed on a meter in the corner of the screen, as opposed to like, what if I did a punch and it did eight damage and it always did eight damage. And if I did this combo, it does 23 damage. And if I do this hold, it does this amount of damage. And you could still do, I, yeah. So I started thinking about like what would a, what would what would be a wrestling game if they actually tried to expose the data, right? And just went like fuck it, you know? Hey, like the the this is inherently different to television wrestling, and so we're going to to kind of move in this direction. And and I started thinking more and more about fighting game concepts, and like what if it'd be like okay, like fighting games concepts will have that. Um, occasionally have that concept and, and wrestling games do this as well of recoverable health, 
Like there'll be some attacks that will drag down your maximum health. And so you'll recharge back up to that maximum, but you'll still have like white health or whatever, you know, that'll get knocked off if you, you know, in, in different circumstances in a fighting game. And I'm like, okay, well, what if they just were better at exposing those systems and better at exposing like, okay, when this meter is full, you, know, you have a finisher meter and you can get multiple stocks of it. So if you have three stocks of a finisher, you can, in some characters can do a super finisher, which means like John Cena does his finisher twice. He rolls through, picks the guy back up and does it again. You're like, okay. And so there almost needs to be a, like health recovery should be a manual process almost. And, and, and maybe, you know, this is, we're getting into fire pro territory in a weird way, but fire pro is bad, has no meters. And so I have never been able to play fire pro, but it just got me thinking like, you know, health recovery, whether it's by taunting or, you know, whatever the process is and you kind of see that go back up or it's like, Hey, I, I burned a stock of my meter to recover 45 health. And he does a big thing and he hulks up or, you know, whatever, whatever the wrestler would do in on television that would make that make sense or, or, or something like there's just, I don't know. Like there, there's, they have some systems like that in place. They don't expose them very well. And I feel like if they were more numbers based and more meter based, you still need to have these moments of like, oh, you could be out of health and still maybe escape a pin attempt and maybe get some health back. Like there, there needs to be something because you need that drama. Um, but I, I don't know. Th these are not fully formed thoughts, obviously, but like there's, there's aspects of this game that I, I want to play it. It's got, you know, all the systems are in place of love. You've got a submission system. You've got a light and heavy attack. You've got all this sort of stuff. It's, I like some of these characters when they are on television and it would be nice to fuck around with them in these different environments and, and all of this stuff. But like the act of doing the wrestling, I find thoroughly unenjoyable. Because you just kind of never know, you know, a lot, of, a lot of it is, again, it, it's very squishy stuff. Like they've got like, oh, you've, you've got this counter system in here. And oh, if you hit the button at this time, you can reverse this. And in some cases, they'll show a button over your head when it's time to, to reverse a, a, a thing. But like some of the other reversal windows are not well telegraphed. And some of that comes with time. You know, you play, you play the game enough, you, you'll, you'll figure that, that sort of stuff out. Um, but like those systems just, they aren't exposed in mechanical ways that you can look at and go, okay, this is better than this. I think that's actually maybe part of it. Like there's a certain aspect of it of, um, what buttons do I push to do the most damage? Is this attack actually doing more damage than this attack? Or like, is it better for me to, because the star ranking goes up if I have a more, more of a variety of moves. So should I instead just try to hit them with everything on the course to building up my meter and hit them with the finisher and then go for the pin or like, what is the right way to play that game? I think that's the part that is, it is left unsaid. It's left unclear in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? Um, because there's just systems in there that they don't really expose. And I wish that they would go further. And, and I, I guess at this point, I, I think it would be cool to go in that direction. Because the other direction, that I, the, the direction I've been thinking about for years is like, the reality of wrestling is that it is a cooperative performance. The reality of wrestling is that, you know, for, you know, when, when fucking Kevin Owens hits fucking Austin theory with a fucking stunner. It is up to Austin theory to jump way too high into the air and make it look like it fucking killed him. And when he does that, you go, Oh fuck. Like, you know, you have the like, Oh Jesus. Like when they work together, well, that shit looks nuts and you go, God damn. Like, you know, it, it is cool. That is what evokes emotion is when those two people are working together properly. Um, and so could you build a game around that? And yeah, you absolutely could. It's just not the game that I think the bulk of like WWE fans would want. If you're like, okay, 
Now you both need to work together to make this move work. And it's basically a rhythm game or whatever like that. You know, that's the game I think would be neat, but like, that's not, that's not reasonable, especially for, you know, a, a brand that at least tries to, to be family oriented. Ostensibly there are kids playing this game that are not going to, not going to be like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do the fake fight. Right. Like that's not, and it's not that it's, it's yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a hard problem to solve that they're not incentivized to solve because the game sells well enough that they're just like, I don't know. Um, but I think they could do better. I think they could do better at representing the in-ring action in a more like television equivalent kind of way. I also think they could be better at making a competitive game that people would want to get good at. Uh, that more people would want to get good at. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that that do put in tons and tons of time and and you know figure out what works for them or or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I that that's that's really my my take on it. I I haven't spent a, a dozen hours with it or anything like that, so I, I can't sit here and say like, oh, this part's broken or or whatever. I've seen some screenshots of some really broken shit. Uh, I saw an animation that I have, I think is in there. I haven't really gone into the creation stuff, but if, if what I saw, the, if the animated GIF I saw online was right, then Kenny Omega's full cleaner entrance is in there, which is super fucking weird. Unless someone modded that. In, I, I don't know. Um, um, I looked in the, the creation stuff and did not find this was last night. So the game had only been out for a couple of hours. They precede the servers with some created characters that are made by people that get access to the game early. Forza does the same thing with, you know, um, uh, with, with car skins and, and stuff like that. Some of the user made, uh, some of the user made car skins. Um, and, uh, I, there was, I did not see a single, no one had made a Kenny Omega yet. That was something I thought about a couple of years ago in terms of just like, what's the popularity of this character with the WWE fans? Uh, and there was no CM Punk in the creation stuff either. He's coming as DLC because, you know, he was added to the the company relatively recently. There's a weird, and I imagine this is something that, yeah, there's a bunch of stings up there right now. Um, a bunch of Brock Lesnar's in there because he is not in the game. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a, the, the wrestling, the, the annual wrestling game release and, and everything that happens with around, around that stuff, um, is always fascinating to, to look at. Um, and you look at it and go, gosh, there's so much work goes into this. And there's like five different versions of Cody Rhodes in there, including one that is an action figure. It is called Elite Cody Rhodes, which I found funny. Um, but uh, but it's like a plastic action figure that does all the moves and stuff, which is which is sort of funny. Um, there's so much, there is so much Cody Rhodes all over that game. Like you launch it, and the main menu, that like literally like the loading screen or the first screen you see that has graphics on it is like fucking four pictures of Cody Rhodes all on the same screen. And you're just like, Jesus. Man, like I get he's the guy on the cover, but like they really, they are extremely all in on Cody Rhodes. Uh, yeah, Logan Paul is in the game, so you can, you can do that. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's a really interesting game because there is so much in it and, uh, that's fantastic. You can play as Bad Bunny. Bad Bunny is in the game. He was DLC last year. The the musician Bad Bunny, if you're not familiar and just think he's another wrestler. Um, there's just a yeah, I don't know. There's there's a ton in it. And if you if you you know, the big boss man is in there and you know, the, there's uh the, one of the things they're selling is this big ret, like retrospective look at all the WrestleManias, which they've done before. They put out a whole game about WrestleMania uh back in the 360 PS3 era. Um and uh, I don't know. I, I think they're really good at uh, at, at presenting um, their historical stuff in in fun ways. I imagine 
I wonder, because there, there's a lot of historical stuff. There's Okay, I guess as of this year's game, there is more historical stuff that they probably don't want to put in a game ever again. You know, Brock Lesnar, very deliberately not in the game. Um, and and so on and so forth. And so I, I wonder, like, there are there are moments in that company that are very vital to its history that now that increasingly involve people that you're just like, Oh, well, we're never going to see them in anything ever again. Um, so they, okay. So they left Brock in, okay. Uh, peeled apple in the chat says Brock is in two matches in the showcase mode. Okay. So they, they left him in the showcase mode, but he is not a playable character. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense from a production pipeline standpoint, um, where, like late breaking news. Hey, Ixnay on the Brock Lesnar. Uh, if if you thought if you had Vince McMahon in any of these video packages, could you edit around that, please? Just blur out his face like they do all the other guys. Um, but like the reality of game development is such that like there was a stent. I'm sure that there had to be stuff with that dude in there because he you know, was a prominent wrestler for a lot of years. Um, anyway, I don't know that that is my long winded way of saying the game still doesn't have the cool story editor that it had a decade ago. And so who cares? Basically like you can't, you can't go make ghost problems. You can't make ghost problems to K 24, the next generation of ghost problems. You can't go make all your user created crazy fucking stories. And so who cares? Their weird machinima editor was always the greatest thing about that game there for like for a while. That was the best thing going. You're like, oh, this is great. You know, VGCW was able to lean on that stuff really well to really great effect and make all these insane backstage uh, storylines and, and characters and, and have it all fit together in a really incredible way. And um they should put that back in the game. They should, they should, that thing should still exist. And if not, because I feel like if they were going to do it, they would have done it by now. But also, you know, hey, it's an annual game. So I'm sure that the list of shit that they want to get to someday is just growing all the time. And then that is combined with the list of things they need to overhaul. Like, oh, this system is now like four years old. We probably need to throw it away and come up with something else. And then we need to add these new modes and, and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I imagine that there's just a, a certain opportunity cost to every decision they make on that game, right? And so the story editor, I get why it would not be top of list. But God damn it. What we need. Gary's mod. That's it. That's all we need is Gary's mod. I know what, what we need is like a, a very easy to use tool set. What we need is someone needs to make a separate game. Someone needs to make a separate product and put it on Steam that is just a fucking weird machinima creator that just happens to include all of the fucking dumb backstage style, like like basically pre, pre-done animation. That's the thing. Because Source Filmmaker, yeah, you could make all that shit, but you're going to rig it all yourself and do this and animate this and you got to walk this guy and do this. Instead, what you want is like, I want to pick backstage scene A. This guy walks up to this guy. And then, hey, and then, you know, some some dialogue appears or or, or whatever. Like someone needs to make the, the glossy, easy front end for people that don't want to like, I'm going to move this arm up here and then freeze it. And then he's going to point and then do this. You know, because you can already rip models out of games and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And the Steam Workshop is rotten. With depending on the game, uh, you know you can you can find a lot of stuff like that. Yes, the movies, but for wrestling, Microsoft 3D Movie Maker, but for wrestling, sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Someone should someone should just make that and let it import ripped and just magically it happens to import ripped models from a variety of other video game engines or. Or what have you. Um, like that, uh, what am I thinking of? I can't, the, the name of it is escaping me right now, but. The, 
the the weird open world chat thing full of mini games that that I have played a handful of times over the past few years that that there's a you know uh, the one that Marco ripped a fucking Violent J model for. Um, I guess I could go to hang on. Yes, ta uh, Tower Unite. Yes, that's what I'm thinking of. Tower Unite, the the build out of of Gmod Tower. Um. Anyway, I'll probably stream some of the wrestling game. Might as well. It's it's like it's it's fine enough. It, it's just you know like I, I've just I have to come to terms with it and just be like this is the game they're going to keep making and they sell millions of copies doing it. I get why they do it. Like I just I don't know. I do at the, at the end of the day I consider myself a fan of wrestling as hard as that is to say sometimes. <laughs> And I've just find I, I find myself left completely cold by the offering of just like the the my rise career mode and the universe mode and a bunch of the other stuff that they include as these kind of secondary modes that are kind of meant to let you fuck around with that stuff. It's just that stuff never never draws me in the way I I, I wish it did. So um so yeah I don't know it's uh it's out there now if you're willing to pay. I think a hundred dollars for it. Um, but the, the full version will be out later this week. If you want to pay, uh, regular, regular amounts of, of money for it. Um, with that, why don't we get into the news? How about it? Let's push this, push this dirty news button. It's a good week. Uh, pretty good week for wrestling. Uh, AEW had a pay-per-view. This isn't really news. I just, I don't know. I just thought while we're talking about it. AEW had a, a, a pay-per-view show called Revolution over the weekend that is maybe one of the best shows they have ever done. Just top-notch, top to bottom. Maybe the scramble match was not as good as some of the others, but, you know, but the... I Yeah, I, I, I came away from that show incredibly impressed. They have done some fun stuff. Sting retired. Um... And his match was fucking bonkers. Uh, Will Ospreay has come over from Japan and joined AEW, and he had his first official match as an AEW guy, and it's maybe the... Well, it is certainly the fucking greatest wrestling match I've seen this calendar year. Um, but goddamn. Just some... Some fun storytelling, some some fantastic wrestling. Just just a like every match had something different. They really presented, and and uh, they they seemed to build themselves this way early on. Of this is the thing they wanted to do is have like different feels to the different matches, different styles of wrestling, as opposed to being this more homogenized thing. Uh, and I feel like every single match they had had something different going on, and um, and was just fantastic. Just fantastic. They've got so many like really good young stars that I think, or well, yeah, young. I mean, you know, like st like stars on the rise. You know, like leave the age part out because some of them are, I think, mid thirties or something like that. But um, yeah, it, it, they've they've got just a, a fucking awesome roster of people that I just want to see more of. You know, um. Anyway, let's get into the actual news. EA laid off somewhere around 670 workers and canceled some games. Making them the latest uh, company to lay off a whole lot of people. They put out two public statements on their blog, one from Andrew Wilson, the CEO of the company, titled, Continuing to Evolve Our Business and Teams. Well, what an innocuous... Yes, it's time to continue to evolve our business. If you could pack up. Like, yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, they are laying off what is approximately 5% of their workforce, which IGN then backed out to around 670 people uh, from the, the looks of things. Um, and they are going to refocus on uh, some of some different areas of content here. Um 
And, you know, hey, this is full of the same talk that all of these statements always are. As a company full of creators and storytellers, we believe in the value of teams innovating together and continue to learn and adopt new ways of collaborating to grow and serve our global communities. It's a great sentence. You just feel, you feel the wrinkles on your brain just smoothing out when you hear those words strung together that way. You're just like, ugh. What were we doing? What's going on here? Given how and where we're working, we're continuing to optimize our global real estate footprint to best support our business. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool, man. Yeah, we should always be optimizing our global real estate footprint. That sounds like closing a studio or two, but, I, you know, yeah, I'm always down for optimize. That's, yeah. We're also sunsetting games and moving away from development of future licensed IP that we do not believe will be successful in our changing industry. Oh, wait, what? Hang on, hang on. You had me there and like, hang on, now, now you're saying sunsetting. I know that word doesn't mean something good. Uh, the greater focus allows us to drive creativity, accelerate innovation, and double down on our biggest opportunities, including our owned IP, sports, and massive online communities to deliver the entertainment players want today and tomorrow. Um, last we, lastly, we are streamlining our comp company operations to deliver deeper, more connected experiences for fans everywhere that build community, shape culture, and grow fandom. Um, so yeah, th this is, they're, they're, they're moving away from, as this news was breaking and, and before we got the specifics as to what they might be shutting down, um, when them, them saying we're moving away from the development of future licensed IP that we do not believe will be successful in our changing industry. I had a moment there where I had to sit down and go like, what the fuck licensed IP? You know, because they don't mean sports. What licensed IP does, does EA even work with anymore? Because they, they don't work with a ton of it. And for some reason, my broken brain was like, they did that Harry Potter uh, cover shooter back in the 360 days. That was a silly game. That was licensed IP. They don't do that anymore, though. And I was like, oh shit, fucking Star Wars. Right. They make fucking Star Wars games. Um, and so they have uh it is it has since been uncovered and and talked about that they have that they have canceled the first person shooter that Respawn was working on that was set in the Star Wars universe. There's a strategy game at another studio that is still in the works. Um but, uh, but yes, this, you know, the, the very day that dark forces remaster was released, um, EA canned, uh, respawns shooter, um, which is funny because like, I'm not a big star Wars guy, but I was like, yeah, I'll play a star Wars shooter. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if respawn is making it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like that seemed like one of the things that they were working on that I was like, yes, great. Yes. I, yes. I'll happily, I'll happily check that out. Everything else. Like, eh, you know, um, the Jedi survivors. Uh, yeah. The, that series will probably continue. They will probably make a third one of those. Um, the day before this got announced, Marcus, uh, Leto, Leto, um, who had left Bungie, I guess, to start a new studio at EA called Ridgeline Games. He left. And then now, then the, a day later, this happened. And part of this news was they are shutting down that studio. Uh, they're shutting down uh, Ridgeline Games, is what it was called. And Ridgeline had been tasked with working on a single-player component for Battlefield. Um... So, like, I look at that, and, you know, you, you look at what they're saying here. We are sunsetting games and moving away from development of future licensed IP that we do not believe will be successful in our changing industry. I feel like if you look at those moves and those two things kind of, well, you know, the, the, the I guess the, the development of that Battlefield stuff has been moved to Criterion. When in doubt, move it to Criterion. That seems like that's been the EA motto for a good long time of just like, oh, we're shutting down. Yeah, black box is done. Criterion's just going to do all of it now. Like, oh, okay. Criterion's doing all of it, huh? 
All right, can we get them to do... Yeah, get them to do the VR Star Wars thing. All right, yeah, Criterion can do it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, and and yes, the question is like, what what kind of what is Criterion? Who is, you know, a lot of the... A lot of the leadership names of Criterion... Well, a lot of the leadership from the burnout era of Criterion has long since moved on. I think there's still some folks there with that pedigree, but... You know, I don't know. Um... So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the long and the short of it. Um, there's another paragraph in here kind of talking about like their view on consumers and the industry and where it's headed is we are also leading through an accelerating, I don't know if they're, I don't know if I say EA is leading much of anything these days, but. We are also leading through an accelerating industry transformation where player needs and motivations have changed significantly. Fans are increasingly engaging with the largest IP and looking to us for broader experiences where they can play, watch, create content, and forge deeper connections. Our industry exists at the cutting edge of entertainment, and in today's dynamic environment, we are advancing the way we work and continuing to evolve our business. That sounds like they want to make larger games that people will play for years as opposed to a single player campaign set in the Star Wars universe. Which I guess in a broad sense I understand. Um and you know, you could you could start to tie those things to revenue, right? You could start to tie things to like, okay, what's going to what's going to make them more money over a longer period of time? And we don't really know that the Star Wars shooter was necessarily focused in this specific way, but if we kind of take it as like, hey, there there's a campaign focused Star Wars shooter in the works. Like, okay, what are you going to sell that for? 70 bucks. You going to do DLC or you going to do a battle pass or whatever? like, no, no, it's not really that kind of game. Uh, we'll do a deluxe edition with some skins, but it's not really, it's not really that kind of game. Okay. Well, we're thinking more along the lines of games that we could put out there and have people play for five years and have them keep giving us money for it. What do you got there? I'm like, oh, we have that. It's called Apex Legends. Great. All right. Why don't you guys go work on that instead, you know, or, or, or whatever the, I, I think there is, I don't think that team necessarily got completely laid off. I think they, they've been, um, or will be, I guess, sunk into some of the other teams at respawn. Um, whether it's an apex team or the next Jedi survivor game or, um, you know, whatever whatever this supposed Titanfall universe thing is that they are skunk worksing still, which they're, they're always that respawns always doing that. I feel like you can always count on like, there's some small weird team at respawn. If you ever get to a point, I think like, you know, like maybe that's like a canary in the coal mine type of thing. But I think if, if respawn ever gets to a point where there's zero discussion about like some small team off doing something weird, if that ever really goes away, then, then maybe that's when I will start thinking of Respawn as a part of EA. I think that's why I had such a hard time attaching Star Wars to EA, because in my mind, I have attached Star Wars to Respawn. Um, I think EA still has a very special thing with Respawn that they haven't really fucked up yet. And I'm, you know, Vince Zampella has, has ascended up the EA tree and is overseeing a lot of other shit in addition to respawn. And so you hope that this happened at GameSpot back in the day. We had one of our three founders left. The other two had left and he ascended up the tree to oversee a bunch of other brands. And, uh, and so he was not as focused on GameSpot anymore. And so as a result, they started bringing in or they started promoting from within, but they, they took other people and they put them in his position and said like, okay, you're going to run, you're going to run this. You're the general manager of this organization and you're the, you're the person who's going to do this. And, and as soon as that happened, we went from having a defender that would keep bullshit from getting to us 
from having someone in that position who knew what GameSpot needed and what GameSpot needed to avoid because he inherently had, you know, he had built it with that initial team back in 96 or whatever. We went from having that level of protection to like a bunch of people with no connection to the legacy of it. They were just like, oh, why don't we do this? And they're like, oh, there's 20 reasons why we don't want to do that. And we've done 10 of them already, but oh, you just want to put your stamp on this thing and force us into a bunch of bullshit. Great. Awesome. Yeah. And that was, what was that? 2005, six. Anyway. Um, And, and, and so it just, yeah. So I, I don't know, like that, that's, that's not guaranteed to always happen when you have that sort of situation, but like, um, you know, when you kind of lose the people that have the ties to what the thing is supposed to be and you have people that just come in and, and, and to them, like, you know, nothing, no part of it is sacred no part of it is special. It's just like, I don't know, let's come in and do this thing. And I don't know, these numbers look down. Let's do this to get the numbers up and blah, 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 blah. And, and they will fucking ruin a thing. Um, and yeah, I don't know. So, so that, that's, that's always, you know, when I, when I heard about Zampella kind of moving up the, the EA ladder, that was the first thing I thought of just like, oh man, are they gonna, are they gonna make it through this? Like, who are they going to put in those positions? Like, is, is he going to still keep a, a close enough eye on that thing to make sure, like I said, cause I, you know, and, and maybe, maybe not everyone feels this way. Maybe this is just a me thing, but, but I feel like respawn has been a very special developer up to this point. I think that they have done, and, and that's not to say that all of their games are great. I, I think those star Wars Jedi games have shipped in really fucked up States and taken too long to patch. And, and, you know, those are games, those are games with issues for sure. Um, but I think that there's a certain feel that they get right with their games that, um, I don't know, in some ways it feels like a lost art sometimes. It's certainly not something you get out of battlefield games. Like there's a feel, there's a, a, a visceral, I like visceral games. Wait. Uh, so I, I don't know. Like I, I, I hope that they are protective of that you know because we saw you know like but but also that can't last forever you know you look at look at like bioware um bioware at one point was also a very special developer right and as the years go on the bioware name got attached to like twenty thousand different like basically anyone at ea that was making anything that had a leveling system or anything where there was like anything resembling an rpg like you're Bioware Sacramento, you're fucking Bioware Des Moines, you're Bioware. You know, like all all these other studios just got rebranded. Um, and but even before then, you know, you kind of the doctors got spread too far, right? You know, you have Doctor Greg in Austin working on the Star Wars MMO. You got Ray still up in Canada, you know, overseeing the other stuff and. Uh, you know, at some point that thing just grew too big and weird. And, and they're like, these guys are hit makers, give them more responsibility. And, uh, and then the thing that made it special isn't, but that's, that's how it's always going to go. Right. I mean, those founders got paid a bunch of money. If they, if they didn't get more responsibility, they would probably eventually leave of their own volition anyway and go make beer or something. I don't know. Um, so I, that's a very natural progression for companies, right. For founders to eventually either ascend or leave or, or whatever. But, um, I don't know. Respawn to me is like one of a handful of, of pretty special developers in this business. And, and I hope that they, um, are able to continue to make some, some cool shit. Um, and I feel for, you know, there's like people across EA. This isn't just a respawn thing. This is just the, the, the Star Wars game getting canceled as a part of this. But like, you know, there's a lot of people across EA that got hit by this. And, and of course, my heart goes out to them as well. It's a, it's a, this business is, uh, uh gross now. 
<laughs> it, it feels like it maybe wasn't always this way, or I guess it was gross in different ways. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, the, the vagaries of all, all business eventually, eventually will get us all. Um, so yeah, best of luck to everyone who lost their job as a part of this and to the people that are suddenly like being thrust onto other teams. Hopefully they will stay the course or, or, or find something that they, Hey, or you can always leave and go do something. I don't know. You know, it's, it's a rough market out there though. I don't know. It's a rough, rough job market. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other, I'm, I'm reading the other statement they put out uh, from Laura uh, Mealy uh, to see if there's anything. Okay. So the, yeah, this is the more specific nitty gritty stuff here. As we've looked at response portfolio over the last few months, what's clear is the games our players are most excited about are Jedi and Respawn's rich library of owned brands. Knowing this, we have decided to pivot away from early devel development on a Star Wars FPS action game to focus our efforts on new projects based on our own owned brands while providing support for existing games. So, you know, like that's a shitty situation, I'm sure, to have worked on that game and and sounds like it was kind of cool uh to suddenly be thrust onto something else potentially but i will say if you had to like take one piece of this and try to get excited about it uh the idea of taking respawn and saying why don't you focus on new projects based on our owned brands um That sounds like they will make, I mean, there's only so much IP that the respawn name has been associated with, right? So, um, maybe that Titanfall universe or, I mean, we, we should just call it the apex universe at that point. I mean, if we're, if we're being honest with ourselves, the apex legends averse has, I feel like eclipsed the popularity of the Titanfall name by five X, 10 X, what I don't know. Um, but Hey, they should make a thing with, uh, mechs and wall running. I think that would be cool. Um, they go on to talk about a battlefield today. We have the largest battlefield team in the franchise's history with passionate people in place across the globe. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, Marcus Leto recently made a personal decision to leave the project to ensure our work continues interrupted. We immediately appointed leadership at criterion to oversee our single player work. As part of this change, we'll be winding down Ridgeline as a standalone studio in Seattle with some team members joining Ripple Effect. They'll continue to work with teams across DICE, Ripple, and Criterion as they build the next Battlefield experience. Ripple Effect was... That's, that was DICE LA, right? They renamed DICE LA to Ripple Effect, I think. So, I, I don't know. They're, they're, the Battlefield stuff always struck me as really weird. Um, because the, like their, their response to the last couple of battlefields, not necessarily being like all that well received has been to just like, let's have more studios working on it in more places around the world. And let's, let's make sure we have a good single player, I guess, is what they were hoping to do with, with Ridgeline. And, um, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know, like, like the, Yeah, it just says, our vision for Battlefield is ambitious, ambitious and exciting. The project is making meaningful progress thanks to the strong leadership of Vince Zampella and Byron Bede, Bede, and dedicated studios committed to building a Battlefield platform our fans will love. Um, I would love to see a great Battlefield game come out. Uh, personally, I, th I think that we could use something that operates at that scale um because there kind of isn't i don't know it just it, it feels like that that thing fell on hard times and i would love to see battlefield kind of pulled back together i think it would be interesting to see a quality first person shooter single player and multiplayer come out of that franchise again it just feels like they haven't like the last couple of games uh have just not not had it. Um, 
or rather by the time they got it, people had moved on, you know, like the last game launched and it just, it felt like it didn't do anything. People were mad about the way the kits were built. And so they, they're like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to fix this. We're going to do this. And, um, but by the time they got there, it was just kind of like, eh, eh. Um, mobile also like mobile kind of gets the longest couple of paragraphs in here. So I'll read this cause it's, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to me. Maybe not you uh, over the past six months, we've brought together the mobile and, a and HD franchise teams under singular leadership across EA sports, FC Madden NFL and the Sims. The next step is setting up our standalone mobile portfolio for growth. So Mobile sports teams moving in with the, or, you know, kind of, kind of reporting in through the same lines as the console games, which probably makes sense to keep them all closer together. I'm surprised that the, and maybe it's this way and I just don't know it, but like when you think about the fucking racket they're running with their ultimate team cards across FIFA and Madden, or I'm sorry, FC, FC, fucking come on. Um, Madden, uh, when, when, you know, I guess they do it a little bit with UFC and, and whatever else. Like, I'm surprised that there isn't a mobile app that just directly ties into all of that same stuff. And maybe they've done that. I, I, I don't, you know, maybe I'm just not aware of it, but, <coughs> um, but it feels like there could be a very unified experience for ultimate team or a more unified experience. Maybe, maybe that maybe again, maybe that exists. I don't know. Um, Anyway, the next step is setting up our standalone mobile portfolio for growth. Over the past few weeks, we have announced we are sunsetting Kim Kardashian Hollywood, Lord of the Rings, Tap Sports Baseball, and F1 Mobile. These games have entertained many people over the years, and it's the right time to focus our time on the remaining games in our portfolio, which we believe can grow. We have some great titles, and I'm optimistic about where we can take our significant library of owned IP. So yeah, it just sounds like that they got sick because like there's not, you know, Kim Kardashian, Lord of the Rings, like uh, those, that that is not their owned IP. So that's, you know, that kind of fits with some of the, some of the focus shift here. Um, it always hurts a little bit uh, whenever EA talks about, as she, she builds it here, their significant library of owned IP. And I think if you've been playing games for a very long time, then you've been on this roller coaster before of EA acquiring a studio and then basically ensuring that that studio never makes a, another one of those games ever again. Uh, and all the people leave and you're like, oh, okay, all right. Like just the, whether it's Bioware or uh, Origin or, you know, like everyone's got their one where they're just like, I can't believe it. They had the best games in the world, and then this happened, and now they don't make them anymore. Ah, um, but as a result of all of those acquisitions over the, the the years, Westwood, I just I just played a little bit of Dune Two uh, in a DOS emulator over the weekend. Fucking Westwood, man. Uh just the, the yeah the the number of things that that company has acquired bullfrog yeah cry to, yeah this, this, the, the it, it's it's it is sad the number of amazing franchises that that company is sitting on um that they will probably never do anything with ever again um The Crusader, no remorse games. That was mine at the time. Hearing that there was a third one of those that they were thinking about making that got killed. I remember being really broken up about that. Um, yeah, you know, that's syndicate. Also other syndicate. Yeah. A lot of people are big fans of SSX and just, I don't I think that there's probably a path to make a new SSX. You would just have to make it. I don't know. You, you would have to fucking, you would have to put a fucking battle pass in it. You would have to make it like, here's a live service SS, SSX. 
Like you would have to make that a game that people are going to play for the next five years. You would have to do what they're, yes, about what they're, what they're in the process of doing to the skate franchise is what you would need to do to justify bringing back an SSX game in this day and age. So kind of, kind of be careful what you wish for, I suppose. Um, I, um, they keep, there was, I, I saw a TikTok. It was an ad for skate. But it was advertising a closed play test. Which I know they've been doing for a very long time now. Um, I am, I, I guess I would call myself worried about what that game is going to end up being. I don't know. It just, uh feels like something that now has been in development for a very long time and they've been you know yeah there's people in the chat saying that they've been doing those play tests for a very long time and um i think everyone is nda'd on those so i'm not really looking for specifics on it but uh i don't know a live service skate game one of my favorite things about the skate franchise was like, and this is obviously stuff they're not going to show in a play test, but, um, I thought it was fun that they put silly stories in it and silly intro FMVs and, but like that it had a progression to it. Um, and so I, I kind of wonder as they move to make it, you know, whether it's going to be free to play or what the, I don't know what the, I don't know what they're doing. Um, like what the, you know, is that stuff going to fall by the wayside in service of just like, it's a skate universe and I don't know, go fucking make your own shit. Um, or not, because that would be kind of a bummer. I don't know. Uh, <sighs> Warner brothers is back in the news. Um, this comes to us from video games, Chronicle, uh, JB Perrette, the Warner's comp, uh, CEO of global streaming and games spoke at a Morgan Stanley conference. Uh, and it talked a little bit about, uh, some of its, uh, some of its plans going forward here. And this is stuff that they got into in their last earnings call. It's not necessarily brand new news, but but it is this this focus. Like, okay, so they just had Suicide Squad come out, and like, I, I you know, I they're they're saying that it did not meet their expectations. They're saying that that it's it did not sell the way it is uh, they wanted it to. I may go so far as to say it kind of shit the bed, uh, but that, they're not going to say that in an earnings call. Um, but back in December, everybody's favorite CEO, David Zaslav said that they were uh, working on transforming their biggest franchises from largely console and PC based with three or four year release schedules to include more always on gameplay through live services, multi-platform and free to play extensions with the goal to have more players spending more time on more platforms. And so Perrette pretty much just, you know, doubled down on that and says, we think the opportunity for us, which is a multi-year opportunity because games is certainly a bit of a long cycle business, but the opportunity is to take those four franchises, which are uh, Mortal Kombat, Game of Thrones, DC, and Harry Potter. To take those four franchises and develop a much more holistic approach. It's always great when these fucking lizard people get on front of a, get in a microphone and talk about a holistic approach to extracting more money out of your wallet, uh, particularly around expanding into the mobile and multi-platform free to play space, which could give us a much better and consistent set of revenue. And you'll see us launching later this year with some mobile free to play games, which we hope will start building that. And then secondarily live services. So rather than just launching a one and done console game, how do we develop a game around, for example, Hogwarts legacy or Harry Potter, that is a live service where people can come today 
and live and work and build and play in that world in an ongoing basis. I mean, of course, of course, everyone wants that. Everyone wants that. Yes. I will. Yes. The, the ongoing, consistent fucking ongoing revenue. Of course you want that. Everyone does. Um, but you know, th this is how you end up with like, there is a, there is a mortal Kombat RPG on mobile right now that I will probably download at some point when they launched the more, uh, the, the, uh, cross-platform play in Mortal Kombat 1. They finally added the WB account system to it. And as a part of a pop-up you get when you launch that game for the first time, it, it does mention, I believe it's called, is it Mortal Kombat Onslaught? They do mention the idea of rewards that are shared across the games, which is not the first time they've done that with MK, even. Um, but it makes me wonder if they're going to try to more tightly tie those things together over time. But like in, in the past, it's been like, um, hey, if you complete this chapter of the storyline, we'll give you a skin that also works in the console game. And, you know, and, and so they kind of try to tie it all together that way. Uh, Galactic. Well, we, hey, anyway, uh, Galactic Marvel, he says, uh, why haven't they made a Shaolin Monks 2? I mean, listen to what I'm telling you that the heads of Warner Brothers are saying about their game business there's maybe never been a worse time for them to make a Shaolin monks too. like that, getting that idea off the ground and green lit and everything else. Like, Hey, we want to make a two player co-op, uh, you know, or, you know, Hey, maybe it doesn't necessarily have to be that you could make a, a, a sequel to Shaolin monks. That's four player. What if you made it a, Hey, every season there's new, what if you, okay. What if you took the destiny framework and put, 12 different colored ninjas into it. Right? Like that's the, the like the, that is where Warner Brothers is looking, you know? And and so I don't necessarily think that this is something that is dangerous to the core of the Mortal Kombat franchise because like I said, they've been doing mobile games for a while. The last couple of games have had fairly robust skin sales and premium currency and easy fatality tokens and season passes like style stuff. And you know, like mortal Kombat one is for all intents and purposes, a live service game. They're on like season four or something right now, you know? Um, but they also are selling DLC characters and, and, and all of that. So like, that's the, the core of it, it's like, it's more just like, hey, the new invasion season has started and it's sort of different than the other ones, but eh, not that much. The invasion stuff, I I enjoyed the first season of that just fine, but I don't, I have, have not found any of the ongoing content there to be compelling. So if anything, like you could look at them maybe building that out into something more appealing on an ongoing basis. Maybe that would do a better job of retaining players who are not playing it competitively, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, at, at this point, like any, any reasonably supported fighting game is also supporting itself with microtransactions and sales of DLC characters and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's, it's splitting hairs. Like, do you consider Tekken, eight to be a live service game. Like it's got a microtransaction shop and they will sell characters and maybe they'll sell some more stuff down the line. Cause I know Tekken seven did some weird, did some weird DLC eventually too. Or like, it wasn't like frame data locked behind a fucking paywall. Um, like a weird thing. Um, but like it pretty much is because they are looking for new ways to get more money out of the people that are playing it as opposed to like, Hey, and, and Harada, you know, the, so, the, so Tekken eight just launched its, um, costume shop. It's, 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 it's skin store. It's clothing store, I guess, which has a bunch of like, there's some throwback costumes in it, which is like, you know, camo Kazuya and some other shit like that. And then just like, it's some shirts. I'm like, okay, what, who cares? Um, 
and Harada got out there in, in a you know in a relatively blunt way that he usually does. Um, and basically said like, yeah, you know, like games are more expensive to make, and also we support these games for years. Um, and so we're gonna. This is what we do to support. The, this is what we do to fund the ongoing support of these games, right? And so I, I, I get it on some level without looking at the books and whatever else. I think you have some people that are just like, well, they didn't do this with Tekken seven. Like Tekken seven is an old fucking game at this point. It was a, it was a somewhat different business back then. And now that we are getting these games and 4k art assets and all this other horse shit, like everything has gotten more expensive. Everything has gotten more expensive. And so as those costs go up for development, they're going to look for ways to get it out of you because they're not here running to run these games at a fucking loss. And you know, like with, with Tekken, he got out there and said like, yeah, Tekken eight is much more expensive to develop than seven was You're like, yeah, but that's across the board. You know, like again, I don't, I don't like bringing it up every week, but you know, we, we back it into this Spider-Man two conversation about how much money that game apparently cost to make. Not every game is that expensive for sure. I don't think they spent $300 million on Tekken 8. But, uh, um, this is why people talk about this stuff as potentially being unsus in unsustainable, right? Um, and so I, I look at it as like, I like it when fighting games get more characters. I think it's cool. I think it's cool when they add characters to fighting games. When I think about Street Fighter 2. And Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition. And Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting. And Super Street Fighter 2. And Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. And how in some cases those were games that were sold to you multiple times. Yeah, not all on one platform. The SNES got regular Street Fighter 2 and it got 2 Turbo. The Genesis got Champion Edition, but it got like special Champion Edition that has Turbo stuff in it. And then also the Genesis got Super. Oh, the SNES got Super as well. Um, and then the 3DO was the only platform to get Super Turbo for whatever weird reason. Um, that's them selling you the same game basically multiple times with the equivalent of DLC added onto it. When Street Fighter 4 came around and they started, started doing... Um, some of the updates they did there and some of them would cost money. They're like, oh, this is arcade edition. And if you don't buy it, you'll still get the balance changes because we have to do that. Uh, but you won't get the characters. You won't get this. And so, you know, so it provided this weird pathway. We're like, oh, okay. Like you're still getting, you're still getting all of those updates and all of those upgrades in your same street fighter four purchase to an extent. You just don't get access to the new characters and some of the other new stuff, unless you are paying them money. And I think that model, I mean, I don't know. I spent less money on that model than I did buying Street Fighter 2 variants over and over again in the 90s. So I, I don't know. I, I, it's better that Tekken 8 goes this way, I think, for example, rather than doing Tekken 8 and then, hey, now we're doing Tekken 8 Darkest Resurrection and now you should buy it again. Even though we did a season or two of DLC for Tekken 8, now those are just baseline characters for the, for this game, and we're going to do more characters again, or you know whatever they end up doing, um, with like no upgrade path or something like that. I, mean, I don't know. Give us seventy bucks again. Give us a hundred if you want to play it three days early, fuckers. Like that would be a bad outcome. Um. So I I don't know. Like it's it's hard math to do, but I I, I do think that we're probably better off for, for fighting games specifically. Not every game benefits from this approach, which is why I think the, the Warner brothers statement of just like, we're going to try to fucking do that, you know, uh, is, is just such a misguided thing because I think if you take, if you take the right game, the right type of game and give it the right type of support for the right amount of money, I think all of when all of that stuff lines up really well, it's great. It's great. Like, hey, we're going to allow you an opportunity to buy more of this game you fucking love. 
and it's going to come in six months, not six years. I think that's fucking awesome. Like, it's, here's a reason to get back into this game. These two new characters dropped. This background is here. This is here. You know, like, whatever. When it's the right stuff, I think that is taking advantage of technology and modernizing this approach in a way that we didn't have access to before. In the cartridge days. In the kind of pre-internet patch days. In the go to game spy to download this Warcraft patch days. This stuff was not possible. The catch, of course, is that you can only really play so many of those, right? So if every game, and we've, we've gone into this, I don't necessarily need to rehash it. You guys understand. But like at the end of the day, if every game is one of those games, you're going to either spend a bunch of money on things you don't have time to play, which, you know, by the look of all our Steam backlogs, we're already doing anyway. Or you're going to almost be buying these games and going like, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to buy any of these updates because this isn't one that I stuck with and these updates don't sound good. Or you're going to buy the first update and go, nah, yeah, you're right. This isn't, this is not for me. Um, and stick to the games you like. And in some cases, those updates will be free. You know, Destiny goes years without hitting you up for a full expansion. One could argue that the game would be better if they without more expansions, I suppose, but, but hey. I guess what I'm saying is that it's just a fundamentally different thing now, you know? And, and it's funny because you'd like to think, and you know, this goes into Naughty Dog walking away from the Last of Us multiplayer thing for reasons of like supporting a live service game the right way, is difficult and expensive. You would think that Warner Brothers might be slightly more reticent to just be out here going like, nah, more of that. Yeah, Suicide Squad. Phew. Didn't really do, yeah, we're, we're not really happy with it. Anyway, we think the DC Universe and uh, Mortal Kombat and Lord of the Rings and uh, Harry Potter, yeah, we, we think that this is, we think that this has got the juice, baby. And so they're just going to, you know, walk right back, back up to the table and put their money down again. Um, it's a risky move. But um, if you do it right, it pays off a lot better than a standard video game for $60 or, or whatever, right? So I, I guess I see why they business, you know, gamble brained business executives, uh, keep, keep doing this. Right. Um, hmm. Is multiverses coming back? People in chat are saying that the multiverses Twitter account is, uh, active again all of a sudden. Hmm. <laughs> what? Wait, okay, last week there's a story here. I'm just looking on something called, I don't even know what this is, Games Hub. Multiverses returned teased by McDonald's Australia. That's video games now. There you go. Multiverses returned teased by McDonald's Australia. And then, you know, the, I guess the, the word is that it may be coming back this month. That'll be a very fascinating um, thing to watch, right? Like, hey, Multiverse is the game they had to shut down because no one was playing it anymore. And it just, you know, it was a good idea that maybe wasn't in the right place and so on and so forth. And so they took the step of saying, we're going to just straight up shut this thing down because we need to get it in shape. If we want this thing to last, we need to take it down to actually get it right, which I, I think is a bold move. I, I like I, if, if they are bringing it back, like at the time I was like, man, like 50, 50 odds if they fucking actually bring that game back to market or if they end up just walking away from it. But, um, 
but like bold, right? Because think about it. Like you're going to just shut this game down. You took a bunch of money from people. You're going to shut it down and be like, ah, you can still play it offline. We'll be back next year. It's a really strong acknowledgement. And I, I, I do want to, you know, kind of give Warner Brothers leadership if this is the case and that it is coming back. You have to give them at least a little bit of credit there because like it's an acknowledgement that like you can't fix that game while you're running that game. You cannot change the tires on the car while the car is in motion. You know, you have to fucking, all right, let's pull this thing over. If we want to give this thing an actual shot at success, we need to stop this thing right now and fix this shit right now because otherwise the game will keep running and it'll be out there with no updates because we're trying to do this major thing, whatever, you know, behind the scenes to try to get this back on track. And then the player base will get super angry about it by shutting it down and saying like, oh, your purchases will still work and you can still kind of play it offline or whatever. But by like, quote unquote, shutting it down, it kind of vanishes from the public eye for a little bit. And, you know, it, like they they take the heat off of that, like long period of time with zero updates where if they were and, and if they were trying to do the major update while also running a live service game and also launching new characters and also doing that then the big update would probably take even longer to come out. So it's like this, yeah, I don't know. It, it's interesting approach. We'll see if it pays off for them. Um, well, uh, yeah, but we'll see if it pays off for them. <sighs> it seems like just yesterday we were talking about game developers getting embraced on a near weekly basis by the Embracer group who went out and bought a billion companies. Now the conversation seems to be around companies getting de-embraced. We've got a pair of stories here um, citing sources. Kotaku was reporting that uh, Borderland, uh, that Gearbox is going to get out from under the Embracer group. Uh, the report here is that uh, Randy Pitchford, the head of the, the CEO and co-founder of Gearbox, though he he rose up to some even weirder position inside Embracer, I guess. But uh, well, I guess it was it was like he was handling the movie stuff too. Is that what it was? Anyway, uh, earlier this week, this would be last week, in which he told employees that a decision had been made regarding the studio's future, with more information to be shared next month, according to two sources familiar with the meeting. Uh, for months now, Pitchford has told developers that there were three possible scenarios. Stay with Embracer, sell to someone else, or finance a buyout and go back to being independently run. Kotaku understands the decision was made to sell and a deal is in the late stages of being finalized. Um, they contacted Randy Pitchford, who gave them a, a non-statement back. Uh, and so we'll see, I guess who ends up owning Gearbox next. I, I can't, I, well, okay. We'll, we'll get into the other, the other de-embracer story here. Bloomberg reported that Saber Interactive, the, uh, one of the larger portions of the embracer group is going to be sold off to a group of private investors. And so it will become a privately owned company with around 3,500 employees, according to the source who gave this information to Bloomberg, and that they will continue developing that KOTOR remake that they have been working on. There's been no official comment on any of this stuff. Um, the other interesting tidbit here is the $500 million figure includes an option for Sabre to bring along multiple Embracer subsidiaries, according to their source. Um, so there's, yeah, there, there are a bunch of studios that can, are considered to be under the Sabre umbrella as Embracer brought a bunch of stuff in. They, uh, they kind of organized stuff and threw a bunch of things under Sabre. I wonder, I wonder if this is just two different versions of the same story and that Gearbox is also going to end up being a part of this deal through that option. Or if Gearbox has a separate deal in place and they'll be going, you know, a completely different direction, potentially with a totally different group of private investors. Or I, I'm just trying to think like what other gaming, 
I Microsoft is fucking tapped out, right? They're not going to, they, they're still going through the ringer. Like the FTC still wants their fucking pound of flesh out of the Activision thing. Um, so they're probably not ready to acquire anything else. Uh, Sony is, yeah, Sony could Sony could maybe benefit. Eh, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't see Sony being a, a likely home for for that sort of stuff. Um, and Bowles in the chat says five hundred five. Five hundred five is in the process of shutting down some studios in uh, some parts of the world, and they have five hundred five just dealt all of the rights they had to Remedy's products back to Remedy. So Remedy acquired all of the rights to the Control franchise, like the Control IP and everything that 505 had a piece of. Um, they got that piece back from 505, so then now they're in complete control of their own destiny. Congratulations to Remedy for getting out from under that. Uh, that's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I, I maybe maybe these all end up being the same story, but uh, but we'll see. Yeah, the the Bloomberg story notes that. New World Interactive and Demi Urge and some of the other studios that Embracer purchased ended up getting folded into into Saber. So presumably Saber keeps all of that stuff intact. Or rather, all of that gets sold and then some of it gets shut down as an, in a round of layoffs after this move. Who knows? Who knows, man? Um... The... <sighs> The Embracer story, like I, that has to be something that will be studied in business school somewhere. Uh, someone's gonna, someone's gonna study that and they'll, they'll learn nothing. Cause why, why would, why would anyone in business ever truly learn anything? But I, I, I don't know, like the, what's the study there? What's the. Like, hey man, the the ride ain't gonna last forever. Like, I don't know what what do you learn in that? You learn that like, hey yeah, uh, turns out a pandemic is gonna artificially you know inflate or change around some numbers that aren't gonna always last. And turns out sometimes they're gonna raise interest rates in a way that totally fuck you over. Or you know don't don't hang your entire company's success on a deal that hasn't been signed yet. I I don't know where the fuck up happened. Right? That's, that's maybe that's why we study it someday but uh, what a weird thing um, I guess this is you know, is this just going to be a trend now of studios getting out from under like everyone's going to pull a bungee but the first part of the bungee thing not the second part sell to Sony part of the bungee thing toys for Bob um, who originally you know when the San Francisco Chronicle reported on them a few weeks ago was reporting that their studio was shutting down Toys for Bob is going independent. They are getting out from under Activision, which I guess means they're getting out from under Microsoft. And uh, they're going to go it alone. That's the studio that just did Crash Team Rumble, a game that is not going to get any more updates. Remember Crash Team Rumble? No, you probably don't. Um, they are, of course, also the Skylanders studio. Um, and then, you know, they kind of got sucked into the Call of Duty stuff a, a little bit. They did that Spyro trilogy the, the, the came out relatively recently. That was theirs as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so this is, it's, it's kind of funny because they are, uh, they're spinning off. They, they they posted this. The the heads of the studio posted this to the Toys for Bob, the Toys for Blog. Um, they're spinning off as an independent game studio. To make this news even more exciting, we're exploring a possible partnership between our new studio and Microsoft. Microsoft is the company that owns you already. <laughs> they already were doing the thing. So, but but this is uh, you know they get to do it on their terms as an independent studio as opposed to just being a very small piece of this weird puzzle where they would probably just end up working support on call of duty for a, a good long time. Um, and so good on them, I guess the, the, as a part of this, they are shutting down their location and becoming a remote work studio 
which is why the San Francisco Chronicle was reporting on that stuff clo- closing down. So what happens when non-gaming publications get into gaming reporting? Is, you know, but uh, but yes, uh, this opportunity allows us to return to our roots of being a small and nimble studio. Look, I'm not going to say that this is what's going to happen. But if they're going to partner with Microsoft, and I think about the Toys for Bob um, Catabob, the games that they have put out, Spyro Trilogy, some of this Crash Bandicoot stuff, you know, even some of the Skylander stuff. Yeah, everyone in chat is already, yes. They should make a Banjo game. You should give Banjo to them. You should have them make a new Banjo-Kazooie. Like, Rare's not going to do it. They've already got their next project lined up. Toys for Bob has... Presumably those people have stayed on. There's some expertise in in the kind of colorful platformer space. What do we even call it anymore? Um, and so th- that seems like a project that would be very hard to pitch internally. But if you were an external partner and the costs are on you to a certain extent and you are doing a publishing deal or a partnership deal with Microsoft... I think that would make sense unless you want to come up with your own IP. I mean, maybe that's the, the other thing is they're like, Hey, we're independent and now we want to use our own IP. We don't want to just use all this other stuff, but I think there's probably, you know, it's not a big mainstream. This is not some, I'm not saying they're going to go make a $70 fucking Banjo Kazooie game. Um, but I think you could, I, I think that that would probably do well. Yeah. Or con- yeah, sure. Conquer. Why not? They could do conquer. Or they could do their own new IP and Microsoft could publish it or something like that. Do a Game Pass deal. Do, you know, whatever it ends up being. But, um, but I don't know. When I think about Toys for Bob and I think about Microsoft, that was, that was what first came to mind is something along those lines. And I bet that they could knock that out of the park. Um, so, yeah. We'll see. <sighs> In emulation news, this this one I, this was something I I like put in the podcast notes, and then it, the story kind of kept evolving. Yesterday, it kind of hit, uh, let's call it a crescendo. Um, Nintendo filed a lawsuit against the creators of the Nintendo Switch emulator known as Yuzu, which has become the preeminent. Uh, emulator for the switch um basically pursuing them under you know like the the nintendo's position pursuing them under like provisions of the dmca and basically saying the yuzu emulator only exists to pirate and facilitate the piracy of nintendo switch games uh they cited a bunch of stuff in there around like um, um, you know a, a million people downloaded tears of the kingdom illegally and the and the yuzu people you know helped facilitate a, a place for them to pl- those games to be played um and also they ran a patreon that saw a great increase in in backers as tears of the kingdom support was being added to the emulator um and and basically citing a, a a number of things around that, uh, and and basically framing it as a DMCA uh, violation around de-encrypting Nintendo Switch games, which it doesn't do that by default. You have to install your own like keys that you are ostensibly ripping from a hacked Switch to begin with, and so on and so forth. So there's there's kind of a so immediately this sounded fucking weird because the emulator itself doesn't necessarily do that encryption on its own. You have to then, you have to provide, uh, you the user have to provide things that are potentially illegal to, that are gray area at best, let's say. 
uh, to make that emulator do what they build it to do. Uh, their, their argument in a lot of ways was, Hey, uh, the only use for this emulator is to pirate games. It has no other use, which I think is an argument that is very easy to shoot holes in because the emulator does run homebrew. You can run milky tracker on a switch. You can run milky tracker inside of Yuzu. In fact, just to name one, um, but so anyway, th this lawsuit, like right out of the gate, I was like, something about this feels fucking off. This doesn't feel right. This does not feel like a slam dunk. This does not feel like Nintendo has the goods, uh, based on how they're framing it because you're like, okay, like they're citing all of these keys and all of this other stuff that aren't really part of Yuzu itself, but Yuzu knows how to take those things in, ingest those and allow it to run. Nintendo Switch games. So like the lawsuit to me as a non-lawyer did not immediately look like something that um, was a very, a, a, in a, like a super strong case in Nintendo's favor, I guess is what I would say there. Um, Yuzu, the, the Yuzu folks, which, so the Yuzu people, they had an LLC created this Patreon was getting paid out to a company and not an individual, which, you know, this, this, this podcast pays out to a company, not an individual. So that's not completely unheard of. Um, the Yuzu folks basically said, we have retained a lawyer. We will get back to you soon. And then basically the next day they settled with Nintendo. So it will not go to court. Um, this does not create any legal precedent. But uh, among other things, the uh, the company behind Yuzu has agreed to pay Nintendo $2.4 million. Um, as well as they are deleting all copy like the the source code is gone off github they will turn the their web domain over to nintendo as a result of this uh they will um cease using other tools like atmosphere and some of this other stuff that is involved in i guess like some of, a lot of it is involved in like just in in hacking a switch like not even, it doesn't even necessarily involve their emulator per se. It's more of a knock on effect of like a hacked switch allows you to dump the game, whatever it is. Um, the 3DS emulator that they also have been working on for the last decade is also taken out by this. That was an emulator called Citra. Um, same deal. The creators of Yuzu and Citra have issued a statement that is now available on their website. They first posted it to their Discord, I guess. Um, and this very much reads like a statement that was approved by lawyers and potentially Nintendo's lawyers. This has a real gun-to-your-head feel to it that, um, that you don't get to hear this way very often. But hello, users and Citra fans. We write today to inform you that Yuzu and Yuzu's support of Citra are being discontinued effective immediately. Yuzu and its team have always been against piracy. We started the projects in good faith out of passion for Nintendo and its consoles and games, and we're not intending to cause harm. But we see now that because our projects can circumvent Nintendo's technological protection measures and allow users to play games outside of authorized hardware, they have led to extensive piracy. In particular, we have been deeply disappointed when users have used our software to leak game content prior to its release and ruin the experience for legitimate purchasers and fans. We have come to the decision that we cannot continue to allow this to occur. Piracy was never our intention, and we believe that piracy of video games and on video game consoles should end. Effective today, we will be pulling our code repositories offline, discontinuing our Patreon accounts and Discord servers, and soon shutting down our websites. We hope our actions will be a small step towards ending piracy of all creators' works. Thank you for your years of support and understanding our decisions. 
that's got a real fucking holding a newspaper with today's date on it vibe to it, man. That's uh, fucking wild. Um, so as people have kind of dug into this and people have been on the discord that they've been running for years and years and, and, and all of this sort of stuff, kind of two things have come to light that I believe are legit, but, uh, you know, we, they are screenshots of chats. So at the end of the day, those are not that hard to fake. Um, two things. One, there's word going around that these developers had a copy of Nintendo's official Switch SDK, which is protected by all sorts of NDAs and, and all this sort of stuff. That, that, that if, if that was ever used in the development of Yuzu, uh, then that, that's not clean room. That's not, you're not developing an emulator in a clean room environment. If you're using the SDK to do it, that you are using Nintendo's owned and operated code to develop the emulator. So if that's true, that right there is like fucking kind of game over. Um, if that's true and that came out in discovery on that lawsuit, it's just like, oh yeah. And then there was also some screenshots of Discord chats claiming that they had a big dump of Switch games that they could pull from whenever they needed to. Um, and so that they were distributing and, and passing bootlegged copies of switch games amongst themselves, as opposed to dumping their own copies and so on and so forth. You can kind of back this out a little bit. Um, so Nintendo games leak, Nintendo games leak online ahead of release. That just happens. Games that are, are being released for the switch. Uh, I don't know where they're leaking from. It used to be suspected that there was sort of a CDN leak that people were able to access the files off the CDN before they were released. But increasingly, you know, hey, you're manufacturing physical cartridges. One of those is going to disappear from some manufacturing line or some distributor's warehouse or whatever, and it's eventually going to make its way online. That's been happening for years. Smash Brothers leaked out days before it happened. The Pokemon games, like, like basically like games have been leaking for like up to a week early in some cases, um, for a good long time. That is not Yuzu's fault. They're not leaking those games, but presumably, I mean, maybe they're the, the, and this is not new in software piracy at all. Console games in particular, at times you had, and, and I, I don't think it, I don't know if it's still this way. It's probably not, but like in the PlayStation one days, and this is a, I, I was at a, conference i i was the moderator for a discussion around console piracy and circumvention techniques years 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 ago and the thing i learned there that i later looked into a little bit was it was from someone i want to say was with naughty dog because they had implemented some interesting anti copy techniques in some of their games all that stuff's been years later that's all been cracked and you know and whatever but like the thing that he said that kind of put this into a different light for me was that a lot of times it was straight up organized crime that it was like Eastern European or Russian, uh, interests were paying people to steal games off the line and get them to them because if they could get them, they could then sell them to like, they had a mod chip operation going. And so they're running stores. It was an insomniac. You're right. It was, it was insomniac. It was, it wasn't naughty dog. It was insomniac. Uh, you're right. Uh, that they had, they had interesting techniques in, in some of the Spyro games and stuff like that. Um, anyway, that there was straight up organized crime involved where they were like, okay, we need to get a hold of this game and we need to figure out how to copy it so that we can get it out to all of these flea markets and we can sell all these silvers to all of these markets um, around our territory, around the world. And so the, these operations started getting more and more sophisticated and they had higher and higher demands from their customers for these games as early as possible. And so they were incentivized to come up with more and more brazen ways to get access to these games pre-release. So they would be looking, they'd be trying to find a crack in the scheme somewhere of like, oh, this, we, we, we know a guy who works at this distribution facility. We got to him. 
we're going to pay him this amount of money to jack games off the line for us. Oh, he got busted and fired. So we got this guy now. And, you know, like basically a weirdly sophisticated operation for what we think of as just like, hey, copied some games or, or whatever. The Nintendo stuff, I don't know if that's the case, but like that system of, of like, hey, th these games has to have to get on trucks. These games have to be shipped from somewhere. Every step in the chain, there's an opportunity for someone to go like, oh, fucking rad and pocket one of them and hope that they make it out. You know, how tight is the security? The iPhone leaks every year and those are supposedly clean room facilities where they don't allow people with phones in. There's always someone taking pictures of a fucking iPhone three months before it's announced, right? So this shit, you know, across the board, never really stays secret. As a result, you end up with Nintendo's games being circulated on the internet, sometimes weeks ahead of their official release. Now, how many times, and this is something that you could probably go back through their archive of blog posts and some of the other updates that they have issued. How many times do you think that the Yuzu emulator was updated to better support a game that was not technically or legally available anywhere in the world. How many times do you think that emulator was cleaned up a little bit specifically to support Tears of the Kingdom and make it run a little better? How frequently did they fix the emulator because like, oh, the textures in Metroid aren't popping in right. Oh, uh, but we can, we can figure out how to do that and we can, we can do... Um, I remember trying to keep up with some of their progress reports over the years, kind of just like looking in on some of this stuff and, and, um, and see how some of that worked. And it did, it wasn't like this every single time, but it seems like it maybe happened a few too many times, um, for them to not have ever indulged themselves and potentially downloaded a game ahead of its official release. And so if you end up in that situation where Nintendo, who has probably been on your Discord for the past year or more, logging 100% of the traffic they can, um, I imagine at some point they retained a lawyer and they looked at the situation and, and said, hey, all of this stuff is going to come out in Discovery. So... If you, uh, if you ever had any acknowledgement of, uh, doing work to the emulator specifically to get an unreleased game to run, you're done. They will, they will have your ass in court. And so I imagine the advice at that point. So, you know, it, it's easy to look at this and go like, oh, well, shit, man, they just, uh, if, you know, maybe they would have won this case in court or whatever and, and all Nintendo's being a bully here and, you know, just threatening them with endless legal problems. And I, I do think that there's an aspect of that that is probably true, but it also kind of looks like, I think as you dig into this stuff, it also looks like that the developers of this emulator probably fucked up on that front and did not keep it tight the way they need to keep it. Um, also, I will say that like the minute you are making money, on it it's a whole different class of it's it's a whole different level of interest in you because you've got money that they think that is theirs and so running a patreon for this thing um the target gets bigger you're painting an even bigger target you're making an even higher profile sort of thing um at that point and you're also in some cases saying, if you want the latest fixes for the latest games, sign up for this Patreon and you'll get easy access to the latest build of it. Um, which that source code, it, it, the source code was open. There are, there were ways to get their quote unquote early access emulator outside of paying for Patreon. And there were, it was, the source code was out there. So, but there's a brazenness to the, the operation they were running and a brazenness to the way they, they kind of presented it combined with basically like, like long story short, I think Yuzu is the most overt emulator that has ever existed. 
more so than virtual game station back in the Mac OS PlayStation days, more so than Bleem. I mean, those were like big targets in their day. More so than um, Ultra HLE when N64 emulation first game became possible years, years, years ago, which that didn't necessarily lead to a legal action, but at the time it was fucking crazy. Um, this is an emulator for an ongoing platform that is seeing new releases, you know, maybe like at, at the midpoint through its existence. So there were years and years of new games coming for that system. It was capable of running games better than its original hardware, which then led to an insane, for, for an emulator, an insane amount of press coverage. Like running stories like fucking the Nintendo Switch it's framey and all fucked up. You could sure run this game at 60 frames per second on this thing. Here's some video of it. Like the willingness for media outlets to publish all of that stuff in some cases is kind of fucking wild. Um, and all of that stuff works in conjunction to make an even greater and bigger target. Because it also exposes it to a new audience and some of them sign up for the Patreon and some of the, you know, like, like there's all of this stuff kind of links together in a way that like, you are not keeping it fucking tight anymore. You are not keeping it quiet. You are not a hobbyist project. You're like, I was just interested in the hardware and I thought it would be fun to, a fun problem to solve to suddenly you are running in a, a business based on your ability to make this thing run the newest and latest games. Um, and so it's not surprising in, in, in light of all of that, that Nintendo would take a swing at them. And it's also not surprising that they would immediately settle if if we were really looking at like, oh, hey, you've got a Discord, you've got a Google Drive full of fucking game dumps that are not your own or also you're sending them to each other, which is piracy on its own. And, you you know, like, like there is a, a certain aspect of that that you're just like, okay. Like, this is much harder to fight your way out of. If they're going to try and present a DMCA argument and, and that this thing is only, it's, it's like the satellite TV argument. They went after... Don't ask me how I know this. They went after uh, people that bought um, things that were used to hack and rewrite satellite access cards. And, um, and Nintendo has gone after people in, in the same fashion, but like uh, basically like Canadian mod chip shops got raided in the early 2000s and Canadian dealers of satellite uh, card unloopers and so on and so forth also got raided by Canadian cops. The Mounties straight up busted in there and they said, you got bung flash carts in here. And they were like, we got all we're selling is maple syrup. Uh, and as a part of that, they also got access to customer lists. Now, Nintendo, I don't think ever did anything with, with that stuff or if it, maybe they didn't get access to it, but the satellite people, they got access to, they knew everyone who bought one of these devices. And so they were able to contact them directly and be like, we know you got this shit and we're going to fucking come get you and try to scare people into settling a lawsuit. Um, that in, for the most part, they never intended to file because the hassle of, of all of that and, and the, the optics of suing individual end users as opposed to the dealers and so on and so forth. It's the same thing the music industry went through with MP3s and Napster. Um, but anyway, Nintendo's been on a long crusade. You can find press releases of them busting up flashcard operations in Hong Kong in the late 90s and early 2000s and all this other shit, and they view it all the same way. They've always had that exact same viewpoint for all of this stuff. Their view is all of it is piracy. Emulation, piracy. Flashcards, piracy. Which I would argue that flashcards have a lot of uses that involve things other than just piracy, but also, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, point being, it has kind of always been like this. Um, and I don't necessarily like, if, if you notice, like there are other 3ds and switch emulators out there. This was not some big action that they filed against all of those. They really just went after Yuzu. And so you, you wonder, did the other, did the other popular emulator just run a tighter ship on that stuff or are they next? We'll see. 
I don't I don't know the answer to that question. But um But yeah, it's uh I, I guess like that that's that's kind of my take on it is that I think emulation is extremely legal. Um, but there are things that have not been tested in court around the DMCA. That's why the, the lawsuit looked interesting because Nintendo was trying to force things in a way that hadn't necessarily been tested in court. And if they won, that would have a, a really nasty effect on hobbyist emulation as well, which would be terrible, a terrible, like that, that would be like there are commercial products that benefit from this hobbyist emulation that like would would be much harder to justify existing and stuff like people have used MAME code in commercial releases before it's it, uh, legally i mean they've licensed it and and done all other stuff so in in that sense it is probably better that there's a settlement here but also if they had fought it and won then that law would have been tested and potentially gone in the right direction yeah there, yes there are yes dave cap is right there are in, in the chat is right there are examples of nintendo using uh ins headers in some of their releases and stuff like that so yeah like they have benefited from hobbyist emulators as well despite running web pages for years that just say this is all piracy um So we'll see. I don't know. The, the, at the end of the day, um, Yuzu was a fascinating thing. Um, but again, it had become brazen. Like I remember when I, when, when tears of the kingdom came out and I was playing it and streaming it, I remember running that stream and playing the game and being like, Oh yeah, the frame rate's a little, hmm, there's a little, Oh, there's some fog here. There's just, and just like the willingness for people in the chat to be like, well, you should play it this like, like demanding practically, you need to play it this way and stop playing it on stupid real hardware. Like there were people that were fervent about, uh, I'm not, no, you need to, it'll run at 60 on a, on a PC. You should be playing it there. Why are you even bought? Like, like a really weird undertone to that stuff that was just like what the fuck man like no like i'm i'm curious to know how it runs on the actual hardware like it's fascinating that all of that stuff exists that's really neat that 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 stuff has come together in such a way it's a shame that this project has been shut down because it's fascinating to see like oh man like that look at what they're able to do this is really crazy um but like the people that are just like, oh, you're a fucking dumbass for running this on real hardware. It was just like fucking weird. Um, just fucking weird. Uh, and a lot of it was around that game in particular, uh, if I remember correctly. But, but yeah, I don't know. It's it's a it's a very strange sort of thing. This is when you look at the long history of emulators and emulators that can play games that are new or recent releases. It has always come with an element of fucking dumbasses. This originally manifested with, um, when game boy emulators could start running Pokemon games and they didn't necessarily run them right at first because emulators were always a work in development. And so game boy emulators, GBA emulators, like all of that sort of stuff. As soon as, Pokemon emulation became a thing. There was like these kids descended upon this scene and became as angry as they could possibly be. This thing, why does it run it right? Your fucking thing sucks. Like, 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 like someone making an emulator in their spare time, like just like, Oh, it's cool that it does this. It's cool that it runs these that suddenly like a bunch of dipshits descend upon them with support requests that are just like, you're fucking garbage like angry of that a Pokemon that they can't play a Pokemon game for free. I guess it, like they, they ran a lot of people out of the fucking scene. They ran, ran a lot of developers out. Just be like, I'm not going to fucking do it's not worth it. Or like, Hey, I'm going to disable, I'm going to make it so Pokemon can't run in this specifically to fucking leave me alone. Some of this happened around MAME. There was a while that, that Neo Geo games were still coming out and MAME was really good at emulating the Neo Geo. And so you had a handful of games like um, SVC Chaos and The Last King of Fighters on the platform and stuff like that, that, you know, I, I remember I bought my KOF 
well, 2001 was the last one, right? I bought my KOF 2001 cartridge from NCS for 300 and change or whatever it was, 340 or something. And for the first several months, I just didn't even open it because I just played it in MAME instead. And the, at the, the MAME developers came up with a rule where they're like, we're not going to emulate games that are less than a year old in our public builds, but they would still do the work. And so you could compile your own version of MAME, uncomment a few lines of code. And so for a while I was comment, I was compiling my own version of MAME every few weeks or whatever, just to make sure that it could still play some of those Neo Geo games. And I owned those cartridges, but it was still just like, I don't know, I thought it was just cooler to do it that way. Um, and, uh, and that also brought upon it a bunch of support requests. People going like, uh, you're just keeping it to yourselves. We know the emulator can play it, but you're keeping it from us. And we're mad. It was just like, yuck. <laughs> People just sucking, basically. Um, it's like the, the source code's out there. You compile it your fucking self. Lazy fuck. It's literally editing two lines of code and downloading one package to fucking compile it. It's, it's super fucking, it was super easy to compile MAME. Anyway, it reminds me of that. Emulating modern platforms never goes well from that specific direction. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, the, the, it was always interesting stuff seeing people, what people were cooking up with switch emulation and the very idea that it existed at all. And I bet, I wonder, I know this number is not zero. Um, but I do wonder how much of an impact specifically the notion that a Steam Deck could do it. Because there was already a little bit of hand-wringing at Nintendo over the concept of the Steam Deck. Of going like, is this a thing? Oh, is it? We're fine with this, right? This is not a thing. Like, you know, there were like that. There was already some element of that. And so the idea of just like, oh, by the way, also it can fucking run Switch games better than a Switch can. I'm sure that there's like some non-zero percentage increase in anger on their part as a specific result of that. Um, not that, you know, Valve's not in the wrong, that, though Valve did fuck up at one point and, and like in a, they had a, a video that included some of that stuff, which is just a, a mistake on someone's part over there. Like, don't fucking do that. That's crazy. Uh, Yeah, so, so that's where it stands. Um, there have been, this morning there was a couple of people that were like, we're forking, you know, because the, the source code's open source, right? So it's not, the source code is just out there. And uh, theoretically not illegal on its own. And so they're like, well, we're forking it and we're starting a new Switch emulator under a different name. And so, we're, and, but, but it was like people going like, and we're looking for coders to help. Like, oh, so you're, not a coder and you're not a person who's going to be able to like continue their work. Also, when I think about the idea of hobbyist emulator creators and why they get into it and why they do it. Uh, well, okay. A couple of things. One, if, if that emulator was in fact built with some knowledge of the switch SDK, then at some point is it is like fruit of a rotten tree type of thing. And Nintendo will fucking screw people to the wall over it again. If they have to. Um, but the reason hobbyist emulators get into this is to solve problems and build things and have fun with that. Like they enjoy the problem solving. They enjoy the challenge generally speaking. And so I think the idea of someone going like, Oh yeah, here's a fairly robust project that might not be legal. I'd love to devote my off hours into contributing to that. Where a lot of the problems have already been solved a very specific way and, and all of that sort of stuff. It'd be more likely that someone would say, oh, well, I'm going to make a Switch emulator now. And I'm going to start from scratch and never look at that shit. That is far more likely to happen uh, as a result of this, or just in general, than for someone to pick up some project and go like, we're going to continue it forward and have that have like very meaningful development going forward. You know, like maybe you'll have some people that can like 
integrate some small fixes and little things like, you know, like, like maybe that's something that, um, th there could be some, some advancement there or something, but it's like, that's, it's unlikely. I, I would say, I would put it unlikely at best that you will see significant development on top of the Yuzu code base. Um, as opposed to either, yes, either helping out one of the existing emulators that are out there that hasn't been pursued legally or starting your own. I'm just going like, oh, you know, I would like to, I would like to build a thing. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, that's where that stuff ha uh, sits. It was shocking when it happened, but in retrospect, now that we're kind of on the other side of it a little bit, um, and some of the other things have, have, have come to light again, again, I, I will say that some of that stuff is being based on screenshots and that stuff can be faked. It's not, you know, this is not firsthand knowledge on my part. So just, it is entirely plausible that, that some of that stuff is, is is inaccurate, but enough people have said, oh yeah, I was on that discord and I saw this and this, you know, that, that like, that seems like that was the case, uh, that they were, um, doing shady shit out in the open, which don't, don't do that. Uh, let's see. Let's get into some emails. How about it? Podcast at guard.bike is the email address. Yeah, it's hard, you know, the, the, it's hard to know, like talking about this stuff in an open way, even I think that there's, I think because I've been paying attention to emulation for so long, like I, there's a lot of stuff that I just don't talk about, um, for one reason or another, um, I'm much more open to talking about it these days, but, uh, this reminds me of, uh, when someone says we decompiled links awakening and now we have the whole game running on PC and look at all this cool shit we did to it. And then someone runs a news story saying, look at the cool shit they did with links awakening. And then five minutes later, it's been cease and desisted off the internet. You know, like someone was making their own Mario maker. Uh, thing that that got dragged offline uh, a while ago that was a pretty cool project. But it's like, it's the hard thing. Like you're making a really cool project, but you're making it with other people's IP. And so if that thing rises above a certain interest level, it starts getting more and more mainstream attention. And the minute it does, some lawyer is going to see it and be like, what the fuck? Um... So I don't know. It's, you know, but I, the thing got off, you know, the, 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 the answer there is with an AM 2 R type of situation or some of these other projects, you don't talk about it until it's done, done. When you are done working on it, that's when you put it out there because you know that the internet will provide and be like, ah, eh, whatever. Yeah. Send me a DMCA. I'll, I'll, I'll delete it. But like, whatever the Yuzu people, obviously that's an ongoing project. And they were running a Patreon and running a business based on all of this stuff. Again, it makes them a bigger target. It reminds me, last little thing. We wanted to sell t-shirts and we did, uh, well, eventually, uh, with a bootleg Oscar Mayer logo on it, but it said Oscar Mike instead of Oscar Mayer. in like 2008 or whatever, you know, whatever year that modern warfare two came out, because that was the year that Oscar Mike became a hilarious phrase because it's in that game every fucking 20 seconds. It seems like, so we thought it'd be really funny to make and sell this shirt. And we started doing it and Shelby, like the, the money people from upstairs were like, Hey, this is, we, we probably shouldn't fucking do this. And I think like me and Ryan were like, this bootleg logo t-shirts are everywhere. This is constantly like, this is, there are so many logo flips and all this other stuff. Like so many companies do this. 
Uh, so many t-shirts are out there with these weird, you know, parody logos and, and we'd be protected by parody, right? It was me. And his response was something I think about a lot when it comes to stuff like this and, and, and everything else. Basically he said, yeah, but like some of these t-shirt companies are just a fucking guy. And so if this guy gets cease and desisted, they're not going to pursue it any, it any further. They're just going to make him stop. Like, remember that like, we're a company with assets. And the minute that like someone in the senses, like, Hey, these bootleg t-shirt guys actually have a company and like potentially millions of dollars behind them. They start to think, can we get that millions of dollars? As a part of this, um, and so that really brought a lot. Of, we ended up just doing the t-shirts and then the guy that we worked with to print the t-shirts ended up taking the money and running. Um, and so we eventually had to find another company cause we had taken a bunch of orders for these t-shirts that suddenly we could no longer de deliver because the guy just took the money instead. Um, and so we had to, we lost a fucking bunch of money on this stupid fucking t-shirt anyway. Um, it took months for us to get the guy, get word from the guy on the phone. And then he just was like, yeah, I needed the money. I, I was, have been having some trouble. See ya. And it was like someone that we worked with. It was a friend of theirs from way back in the day. And so you think you're throwing somebody a bone. You're like, oh, let's keep it in the family. Well, yeah, here's someone. Yeah, we, I, I, I know a guy. Um, and that ended up going bad. But uh, <laughs> just goes to show, don't make bootleg Oscar Mayer t-shirts, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, that, that, that's a factor here as well. You know, if these, if these were just hobbyists that were doing this, there would probably be a cease and desist. And probably not a money, not probably not money attached to it because they wouldn't have, they would not have made all that money on Patreon or whatever else. Not that they, I don't know that, I don't know how much money their Patreon was making. I don't know if they made 2.4 million off that thing or what, but that seems high to me. Um, but yeah, as soon as they can look at it and go like, there are assets here. We have, we have seen damages because that is, that's our money. People should have spent that on copies of Zelda instead of this, which that's a incredibly fucking shaky argument. That's not a, I don't think that that would have, if they had tried to make that argument, I don't think that would have gone well for them, but, but who knows? Um, lawyers see that shit that way and they go like, that's our money, baby. And they go out and get it. So, so yeah. Um, Let's get into those emails. Podcast at guard.bike is the email address. Why don't you send in an email to me and we will read it and we will talk about it. Um, let's see. What do we want to... Cincinnati Eric writes in and says, I don't know how to word this question, so I'll try to be as succinct as I can. What in the Kentucky fried fuck is up with internet search engines nowadays? I swear it used to be much easier to get straight answers or information whenever I Google something or ask Mr. Jeeves something, but nowadays it feels like I have to sift through incoherent trash or endless sites that are not related to the queries in the least bit. Uh, when people tell me to just fucking Google it, it makes me think they've never tried Googling something in the last decade. Am I out of touch? Did I forget how to properly Google? Or are search engines obsolete or garbage or in shitified? Yeah, that's, you know, Google is not incentivized to answer your question. Google is incentivized to provide you with the answer that makes them the most money. Whether that's showing you an ad supported answer. Um, but like Google is an advertising business. They make their money through ads. And so when you type in a search engine, sometimes they are rewriting the query in the background to be like, what's the maximum amount of money we could make off of this query? Whether it's a leads driven business or, or whatever AI and all the bullshit that's happening now will certainly make things worse. 
but like the idea of a web page that's full of gibberish deliberately trying to get Google to serve things up higher in results. That's a story as old as time. Recipe websites were terrible before AI was a thing, right? I mean, that's not new. Um, and so, yeah, at the end of the day, a part of it is, is just like, Hey, we are, we are trying to serve up results that will make us the most money. And so you are not the, you are not the customer they are trying to serve there. It's the advertiser. Those are the customers they're trying to serve. And so they're trying to push you in specific directions when they can, because they will make certain more money off of some queries than others. Um, I don't think every search engine is this way, but I've, I don't know that I've found what Bing is not better. Bing is terrible. I tried to switch to Bing for a while. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm a Bing it dog. We're going to Bing it for real. I'm back on Google for now, but I, I don't, I don't have to search for a lot of shit. And when I do, it's usually like searching my own history for a page I was visiting last week or something like that. Um, there was one I was trying out for a while that was like very deliberately AI powered. Uh, and, and I was trying to use that for a bit and that one showed some promise, but like kind of, kind of sucked in its own way. DuckDuckGo, like the, they're, they, they purport to have privacy focused searching, but like they, I, I want to say DuckDuckGo just gets its results from other search engines. Like the, the, the AI powered search engine I was using was just like, yeah, we use Bing, but also we filter it with an AI thing. And you're like, no, that's not, that doesn't, that doesn't help. <laughs> it's still, it under, it's still Bing underneath. Um, does Yahoo even have a search engine anymore? Is yahoo.com still a search engine with like an index? No, it's like a news page. Okay. But they do have a search bar up here. Search the web. Hardcore pornography. Free hardcore sex videos. I mean, you know, all these results are uh, what I asked for. So, Yahoo! Shout out to all my, all my Yahooligans out there. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, the, the, we're the last. We're the, we're the the last people that people that search engines or any part of the internet cares about, right? So I don't know. It's a it's a bad it's a bad time to be online, but also, what are you gonna do? Not be online. I just use different parts of online now. I just I don't use Twitter. That alone has actually been quite nice. Shifting to other services. I use Tumblr a little bit less and I'm trying to use co-host a little bit more. Yeah, go ask Jeeves sometime. You know? Head on over to guard.bike. What are you searching the internet for? You could be looking at my YouTube channel. I don't know. Uh... Brandon from St. Louis writes in and says, retro video games. I find myself becoming extremely bored with what most of the big studios and publishers have been releasing for probably over a decade. And it's only getting worse for me so much so that I've started to return to my roots. I picked up a 27 inch Sony CRT and hooked up a bunch of my old game systems. And I feel that love for games that I used to have back in the late eighties and nineties. For a while, I thought I was growing tired of video games, but that's far from the truth. I still have a deep love and passion for them. A lot of indie games kind of give me the old school vibe when gamers used to make games and not suits. I know the gaming industry is going through some tough times right now, but it makes me believe that maybe we can return more to our retro roots and bigger focuses on smaller or indie games. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is you don't have to like have, I mean, I, I mean, sure, I guess, but like, you don't, you don't have to go all the way one way or the other. There are a lot of new games coming out that, like you said, smaller games, indie games, what have you. There are so many games coming out 
every single week. It's like 80 or 90. Or like, someone was saying is that Steam gets like an average of 40 new games a day or something. I, I think that that's, I think that sucks. And I, I, and you see it on the console storefronts as well. Like when you go look at the Nintendo Switch storefront, the eShop, if you will. If I were to do a show reading out new releases that were hitting the eShop every week, which who would do that in the first place? That's a terrible idea. It would be a fucking nine hour show. And it would be a, such a weird variety of games. It would be, impo- it would be impossible. Um, there is so much junk coming onto the eShop. There is so much like just like cranked out like shovelware type stuff appearing on these platforms. And so like uh, Matt, you know, that's when we talk about the discovery problem. That's what we talk about, right? It is like you have developers out there, established developers selling $60 games and they're, and they're ending up in storefronts next to like all of these like 69 cent fucking garbage dumps. And like, I don't know what the right solution is because I, I think we do need a, a world where anyone can publish games on any platform, right? We, we, that self publishing has been fucking awesome. The ID at Xbox stuff has been really great. Uh, self-publishing on PlayStation is definitely a thing as well. You know, of course, of course, they've had to make some changes on the trophy stuff on the PlayStation side because people were seeing sales based on like, oh, if we just put out a garbage game, but it's got a platinum trophy and you can earn that platinum trophy in 90 seconds, we can sell this thing for two bucks. Like PlayStation had to update their trophy guidelines for developers uh, pretty recently. Like last, I want to say it was last year. Maybe it was the year before that, but it was, but it's like in the last couple of years, they had to make some dramatic changes to what they consider a game and how they allow, uh, you to sell like the same game six times. But like this one's got blue bricks instead of green ones, but they all have platinum trophies like that shit. Crazy. That shit's crazy. Um, I bought one of them. I forget what it's called, but I, I, I bought one of these trophy bait games not that long ago out of curiosity for it. Um, but like that is, you know, we, I don't like the word in shitification and people throw it around now. Like it's a kitschy cute term. And I just, I don't know. I think, I think we, we, we could have done, we could have done, done better for a jokey term for things going bad. But, uh, just, it sounds like a fake Sounds like a fake Simpsons word. I don't know. Uh, that caught on, you know what I mean? But, uh, but like the way that you, when you go and look at the eShop and you go and look at all of these, I, I want to tread lightly. I want to call them non games, but like that's it's again, cause there are indie different, some, I don't want to prevent people who are earnestly making games that just happen to be bad. I don't want to stop them from doing what they're doing. I want them to reach out and and ship their games and and reach their dreams. And if their games don't sell, maybe they'll get better next time. Like I, I want that genuine effort to still exist. But how do you filter that in such a way where the person who's just making a bad thing because they're not very good at it from the people that are cynically trying to make a thing and be like, we're going to make it 90. We're going to charge $900 for it, but then put it on sale at 99% off. Uh, and so it'll rise to the top of the sales charts in the eShop. And like, like the people that are trying to game that system, we're going to name a game just nine A's so that it surfaces at the top of every single alphabetic listing we've got, uh, you know, like, how do you, it's like, you know it when you see it, right? But like, you don't want to, it's, it's very hard to implement policy to prevent the dog shit scam games without also catching real independent development in there. So how do you catch the people that are gaming the system and making garbage? How do you, how do you catch them while also still allowing for a, a very you know, robust and, and, and uh, how do you allow for self-publishing? This has been a problem that's been going on for years and years and years. And, um, it's frustrating. 
it's frustrating as someone who is just trying to find new games and find what's coming out. Uh, and I imagine on the other end of it as a game developer shipping a game that you've been working on for two years or wh however long into this environment where everything gets lost immediately unless you've gone out there and found a way to um, to to rise above that noise somewhere off platform like I, it's it's really it's fucked up um But like, I would, I would hate to be, and I, I could, I feel like I could, but I would hate to be the person who makes those decisions. Like the person who has to say, this is not a real game. We're not publishing your game. You know, like, because how do you like, it, it is a very human, it should be a very human process. Right. But how do you, again, how do you do it and catch the scammers? while not catching the people that, you know, are just potentially making a bad game. Innocently making a bad game. That's, that's a, it's a hard one. Um, that I don't think any of the platform holders want to do that. Uh, but they, they should be finding a way to do it or, or, you know, cause it's the temptation is like, we need to make sure that we are, uh, algorithmically making sure that games rise to the top because there are so many we don't want to miss one by having it be a human process we don't want it to be biased we want yeah we want to we want games that are selling well to rise to the top of these lists but like oh whoops someone went out and bought a hundred copies of their own game and so now it's at the top of this very specific genre page because they floated it there like there's so many different ways to try to game the system and scam it and all this other stuff like you need to Everyone needs to be doing better on that front, but that I, that is all I can really say. I don't have an answer to it because if I did, I, you know, like if I did, someone else would have come to that conclusion as well and would have fixed it by now. So I don't know. That's frustrating. But to get back to Brandon from St. Louis's point here, tons of games come out all the time, big and small. Uh, there are a ton of games specifically that are chasing that retro vibe too. And I think some of them do it quite well. Um, and some of them, you know, are, are kind of moving in new directions and doing new things and new concepts that, that fit into these old genres and, and what have you. And I think that stuff's fascinating too. So, you know, yeah, I, I play a lot of old games too. Um, but I also still like big, crazy, expensive, weird video games, big, massive games. Like I like to see that shit. And so I don't know, I, I appreciate the variety across the board, but I, but I do think that, yeah, well, you know, not every game is for you. It's not, you know, because it ain't the nineties anymore. Back in the nineties, when the only people playing games were people who played games, everyone played every game. How do you think final fantasy seven got to be so big in some ways? Final fantasy seven was a game that benefited from that mentality and also led to the conclusion of that mentality for more and more game genres because then you saw a billion more of those types of games come out and they were not as well received. And so players either had to come to the realization of like, yeah, I'm down with this shit. I will. Yes. I want more of this shit. Give me Kadelka. I don't know what the, what the fuck. Um, Give me the Suikoden games. Give me the Persona games. Give me, you know, like, like all of that stuff that was happening back on the PlayStation one. Um, or they realized, oh, I, this is, I liked this game because it was big and weird, but I don't want to play a ton of these. I don't want to play 20 more of these that are not done as pompously and over the top as this one was. So I'm good. Um, And that's a good thing. Ultimately, you know, gaming grew up, gaming grew out, uh, and, and started appealing to more and more people over time and, and people with varied interests. And, and now look at us, there are so many games coming out for so many different people that like, if you're complaining about a game, get a refund for it. If you failed to, in, to get it in the refund window, that's unfortunate. That does happen. But like, go play something else. Like who has the time? You know, there's so much shit coming out all the time. Like it, it's, it's very easy to get hung up on 
and I think it's it still is fair to get hung up on the big games because those are the games that are meant to be crossing those borders and and crossing those genre lines and, and appealing to wider audiences and it's more interesting discussion. I think it's not me saying that criticism is invalid or whatever, but like, you know, just play something else. There's, there's so much. And if you find it, yeah, if you find yourself, say Galactic Cal says, my problem is the games I like are not the popular games anymore, so they aren't made. I'm kind of with you. That is sort of, that is sort of where I'm at. It's, it's a lot of the conversation that we have around Microsoft and about the first party Xbox, um, output, right? Is I feel like they're kind of making smaller games in hopefully a more responsible way from the, but like they're, you know, we're not seeing these big massive games that we used to, the, here's the gigantic Halo release. Here's the gigantic Gears of War release. Like the, their, their games are not as big as they were anymore because they've spread out and now, you know, uh, hell, Hellblade is one of their bigger games that they keep coming back to over and over again when it comes to promotional stuff and, and Maybe that's a way to tackle the unsustainability of massive first party games. If Hellblade was a $300 million game, it would not make its money back. I don't care how much you put into it. So it's the right size budget for that game, I'm guessing. But I, yeah, I don't know. Man. It's, it's Things have definitely changed. Um, I just, I find myself interested in a lot of it, but yeah, there are certainly games that I'm not final. It's speaking of final fantasy seven. I still haven't played, um, rebirth yet. I was all set to play it. And then I read a pretty compelling article on kotaku.com. It was basically like, stop lying to people and saying that they can play this game without playing the previous one. <laughs> And kind of going into how many developers have done that over the years. I've, I've said before, Mass Effect 3 was a game that EA desperately tried to promote as this is a great place to play. This, this is a great place to jump on board. Because they have to. Because they need to sell more copies than they did last time, not less. <laughs> and if you're just selling to the people that bought Mass Effect 2, then you're fucked. And so Square is now in that exact same position where they're like, no, it, this is just any, any one of these three will be a great place to jump in. And I know they've created like a, a recap video or something that you can watch at the start of this one. Um, but yeah, like, should you even play this remake if you haven't played the original Final Fantasy VII? Like, it, it depends on how much you want to get out of it, right? I mean, I know the events of Final Fantasy 7 despite personally I think I punched out somewhere in the early parts of disc 2 of just like I don't want to fucking do this anymore um but then the last Final Fantasy 7 remake I played some of it and I was like I'm cool man like it's really neat I really appreciate that they are making that I really love that they are doing different things with the story and, um, and I think that's awesome. Like everything I hear about this final fantasy seven remake, everything I see about it, I'm like this fuck, that's fucking fantastic. Um, but I, I'm just, I don't know when I, when I went to go play it for myself, I was like, eh, this gameplay is not quite pulling me in, in a way that, uh, makes me want to stick with it. So I, I didn't play and end up playing through all of the first remake. And so now I have the second one and I'm like, well, I, I guess I'll fire it up. But I'm like, I'm just going to have the same experience, right? I'm just going to like probably play like three hours of it and just be like, yeah, I don't know. This combat's kind of, huh. so it is, it has not been like a super top of mind game for me just because I just, I'm, I'm not, they don't have me hooked because they did not hook me in the last game, I guess. But that's life, I guess. Luckily for me, there's like a 30 other games that came out. So Like Euphoria, the Saga 2, which I installed. Or, you know, there's always room for another run of Bellatro. I don't know. That's going to do it for me here. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Be back tomorrow to do something. Maybe a little, probably look at Euphoria, the Saga 2.
which I installed or and haven't tried. Yeah, Pacific Drive. I, I feel like Pacific Drive could go either way. There's something about that that sounds like a really cool spin on that genre and that style. And then uh, when I hear about what people have to say about the way that game saves, which seems very deliberate to the type of game it is, and I uh, can't necessarily fault it for that, but also I look at it and go like, I'm not sure that that game is going to fit into my life. Um, but hey. Play whatever. You could be unlocking more stuff in Deep Rock Galactic Survivor right now. In fact, I'm going to get back to doing that. No, I'm not. I'm going to go see what the kids are up to. <laughs> I'm going to go see what the kids are doing. Maybe try to catch some lunch, uh, which usually means eating their leftovers. But hey, what are you going to do? Uh, I'll be back in the morning. We'll play some video games. And then, of course, Friday, we'll look at some 8-bit Nintendo classics. And we will rank them. Weird list last week. Treasure Master. What a fucking crazy thing, man. Go watch that. That's on. Go to guard.bike. Go watch that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, there's that Xbox stream tomorrow. We'll we'll stream that. We'll watch that together. The Xbox partner showcase, whatever they're calling it. We'll see what third parties are bringing to the big green box. I don't know. Let's yeah. Let's get back into that type of 90s game writing. The Big N contacted its lawyers. It's been a long time since we've seen a game from the Blue Bomber. But Capcom's got a thing coming up, so hopefully they'll be announcing the next adventures for Mega Man. Jesus Christ. What the fuck's wrong with me? I'm going to go. <laughs> Have a good one, and I'll see you tomorrow or next week or both. Uh, take care. And uh, we'll do this again soon. <laughs>